Number 10, just his bones and a beautiful memory. This one chokes me up every time. It's not only physically brutal, but emotionally brutal. Like so many superhero defeats that stick with me truly seem to be. In this case, it is Superman himself who is defeated by his friend and ally, Wonder Woman. This all goes down in the story from outside of the main continuity, Wonder Woman Dead Earth. In this comic, Diana awakens in a post-apocalyptic world where she seems to have forgotten what happened to the planet. There was a great war and following it a great fire and it is in issue 3 that she actually finds out the truth about what happened to this now dead earth and her involvement in that. What happened was the great fire and the great fire was her. In the past, in Dead Earth, the Amazons attacked humankind. And while Diana attempted to lead peace talks between both sides, this ultimately fails and then the humans decide to basically nuke Themyscira. Diana's full power is unleashed when her bracelets are removed, but it's not enough to stop the nuclear strike against her home. In the end, her mom, her sisters, her entire world are all destroyed and lost to her. Superman rushes to help but also arrives too late after prioritizing his own parents, who also were victims of a nuclear attack in small her power fully unleashed, heartbroken, and filled with rage, Wonder Woman takes out her frustrations on Superman. The two fight, and ultimately, this untethered and unlimited power that Diana has tapped into proves to be enough for her to destroy Clark after their fight also has obliterated the Earth via collateral damage. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, why not show us you love us by clicking that subscribe button? I know there's a bunch of you that aren't subscribed, so, you know, if you want to subscribe, it just it helps us out. Number 9. The Just Justice League are dead. Welcome to Dark Crisis. Or really, welcome to Justice League issue number 75, the beginning of Dark Crisis. In this issue, the Justice League goes up against Pariah. Pariah used to be a scientist, trying to stop the death of universes, who basically became corrupted when he was cursed to watch worlds end over and over again, without being able to do anything to save them. I mean, to be fair, that would, I think, make pretty much anyone corrupted and kind of crazy. Pariah is back, and this time he intends to end the suffering of the multiverse by ending the heroes of the main continuity. He does this because he believes in destroying the main continuity, he'll kind of be able to end the cycle of destruction, seeing it as kind of the root of the problem because the heroes from that reality have in essence meddled too much with the state of the multiverse. So he's like, in order for us to save the multiverse, we kind of got to get rid of you guys. As a result, he seemingly handily defeats the Justice League in one go, blasting them with his own power after making them fight sort of the darkness, which is like an army of evil characters they fought before, but really it's just the darkness, leaving only Black Adam to survive, return to Earth, and tell the tale of what happened. Of course, the Justice League would return because, you know, this is comics, we gotta come back around to it. But still, this issue and their initial fate here was pretty wild. Number 8, and that will be the end of the X-Men forever! What can I say? I'm a sucker for the classics. This one comes to us from the old days of X-Men, the Jack Kirby and Stan Lee days. In issues number 17 and 18 of Uncanny X-Men, Magneto is revealed to be the villain who has infiltrated the X-Mansion, having returned from outer space where we last saw him be transported to by the Beyonder. He has returned to once more resume getting revenge on the X-Men and mankind. It isn't until the end of issue 17 that Magneto is revealed as he greets the parents of Warren Worthington III, aka Mutant Studio. Angel's parents, having handily defeated almost all the X-Men one by one after luring them to the mansion. Magneto's plan is to send them up in an air balloon, which is basically like attached to a metal ball that contains them. Fortunately, while initially defeated in issue number 17 and struggling to escape in issue number 18, Iceman ends up getting showcased as the true hero in this issue. Kind of helps save the day here. Almost single-handedly defeating Magneto just as the X-Men escape their deadly air balloon fate and return to back him up. Number seven. You are not my father. Probably one of the most emotional fights, especially when we considered that at the time we had a lot of complex emotions about, uh, well, at least one of these people, happens between Professor Charles Xavier and his star pupil, Scott Summers, aka Cyclops. I'll let you guess about who we had complex feelings about. This one went down during the events of Avengers vs. X Men. It happens at a tense time in the history of the X Men, not just because they were up against and at conflict with the Avengers as a result of a debate about what to to do with the incoming Phoenix Force, but because of the revelations that had happened in recent years in regards to Charles's more shady practices, like 
not telling his students that the danger room they were training in had actually itself become a sentient AI mutant who was in essence uh, kind of being oppressed by the headmaster of the Xavier Institute, for example. In the end, Charles attempted to talk down Scott, who at this point had the full power of the Phoenix Force, or he takes the full power of the Phoenix Force during this fight, and uses it at his fingertips. Basically, he was also being corrupted by that. Himself filled with a bunch of complex feelings at the time in regards to Charles, Cyclops ends up refusing his once mentor's help, and instead kills him in a blaze of Phoenix flames. Despite the fact that Charles at this point was a controversial figure, he was still, I would say, considered to be more hero than villain. And despite the fact that Cyclops himself is usually known for being a hero, he still defeated a man often also known for his own heroic and idealistic dreams. Number 6. The Day the Proudest Most Noble Man Ever Finally Fell Obviously I'm kinda trimming down that quote a bit, but it just fits a little bit better in my point. What an iconic defeat. So iconic it not only shook the comic book world, but also the everyday world as well, making headlines. And sure, all in all, this was kind of a publicity stunt to help boost comic sales, but it also became a huge story for comic book fans everywhere to look back on for years to come. While Superman would return, his defeat against Doomsday and ultimate initial death in the comics would be felt the world over. The death of Superman is epic, and I personally always like coming back to it, not just for Clark himself, but for the characters that are a big part of his world. Lois and Jimmy, his parents, John and Martha, ugh, makes me feel so many emotions. Also, why was Jimmy so handsome in the 90s? I ask myself that every time I return to Superman comics in the 90s. I'm like, Jimmy, you're looking real jacked. Number 5. Take heart, kitty. Oof, this one hits me right in the feels. I go back to what it felt like the first time I read this one, and whoo, it got me. This defeat comes to us from the pages of one of my favorite ever X books, I believe, the first volume of Marauders, which started back in 2019. I think this is one of my favorite X books of all time. I mean, I'd have to really like think about that and rank those, but pretty sure this is up there if it's not in the top five. Although, I think it is in the top five. In issue number six, we're caught off guard when Sebastian Shaw shows up on a boat where Captain Kate, the leader of the Marauders, has been left alone. Now, for those who haven't been keeping up with, you know, the Krakoa era X Men stuff and what it means for Kitty Pride, initially she had problems using the gates on the island and basically became the captain of a ship and the leader of the Marauders. Not Sinister's Marauders, not those Marauders. She was reclaiming the name for a heroic group of buccaneers that would basically sail the seas and help to free mutants in countries where they otherwise were not free helping to bring them to Krakoa. And honestly, the team is also star-studded. Here, Kitty preferred to go by Kate. That is, until she died. Sebastian Shaw shows up to attack Kate with fast-growing Krakoa seeds. Considering she can't use the gates and currently can't phase through Krakoan materials, Kate becomes restrained as a result. Lockheed is netted and tossed overboard, and Kate is left to sink alone along with the ship she is on, which Sebastian, of course, blows a hole in. This plot point is made even more devastating by the implication that Kate will not be able to be resurrected as this plot point is made even more devastating by the implication that Kate will not be able to be resurrected by the five as a result of her inability to interact with Krakow and Gates. Number four, everything cracked. The final crisis story is all about the brutal defeat of superheroes and really kind of like everyone on Earth. Final Crisis was the story of how Darkseid basically took over the world by broadcasting the anti-life equation to everyone on the planet via email, text, radio, and television broadcasts, basically making them realize that he is the one true ruler of everything and so they may as well just give up and surrender to him. It was brutal, devastating, and honestly affected pr pretty much everybody in the comics. Eventually the heroes would manage to rise up and take back the planet, but for a while there, oh, it was really bleak. Things got so bad that they even caused Batman to break his one rule against using guns in order to take on Darkseid. And this event started with the death of Martian Manhunter as well. Rough. Number three, the one true enemy of the great Charles Xavier. Oh boy, we are going to the ultimate universe for this one, so you know it's gonna be brutal, right? This comes from the Ultimate X Men series. Here, Sinister, who looks super different in this universe, so if you're like, wait a minute, who's that? That's Sinister? Yeah, it is. He infiltrates the X Mansion and manages to sneak up on Charles Xavier himself, despite his immense telepathic powers. Xavier here is no match for Sinister, who takes him out of the security room he was in, where he was seemingly surveying his students. When Charles asks Sinister where he's taking him, Sinister responds that he's escorting Xavier to his one true enemy, and then he pushes him down some stairs. Mm. 
It's completely awful, really. Xavier isn't the only one who gets brutally and honestly insultingly messed up by Sinister in this issue. Angel also in this fight goes from being intimidating in one panel to basically mentally manipulated into choking himself against his will in another panel. So yeah, which I mean, I don't know. I kind of expect something like that for Angel, but Xavier? It's not fair. It's not very. That's terrible. <laughs> Number two. Instead, I will simply break you. Possibly one of the most powerful moments I've ever read in Batman comics. This epic issue that was an integral part of the Nightfall story is a whirlwind of a fight. And not only that, but overseen by a powerful inner monologue from Batman about all the wounds he has taken to get to this point that truly highlights the struggles that really sum up this character, who against all odds always comes out on top. Right? Not this time. And issue number 497 of Batman. This was the moment that Bruce fell in his fight against Bane. Bane came to finish him, but rather than kill Batman, decided to simply leave him broken, breaking his back over his knee in that massive and iconic splash panel. Number one, but I saved you. I did it. Oh, this one made me cry all over again as I sat at my desk and reflected on it, revisiting it again. Oh boy, okay. So here we're talking about the death of Spider-Man, which honestly happened more than once in the ultimate comic book line and universe, but I do think that this is my favorite death. Hmm. This is Spider-Man's death done right, is what I mean, in my mind. If you have to do it, obviously, because I don't think many of us would really ask for something this heartbreaking to happen, but you know, here we are, it happened, and it's so sad. During Ultimate Spider-Man issue 159 through to issue 160, we see Peter in his final fight, in the final moments of this final fight. Unmasked and with nothing really left to lose, he is forced to give it his all to protect the people of New York City, and more specifically, his friends friends, his family, his loved ones, and the people of his own neighborhood. In the end, despite everything he does in this epic fight, which spans multiple issues, he is defeated by the Green Goblin. And the ultimate version of the Green Goblin is an unstoppable, and as we'd later find out, a mortal tank of a villain. This fight and defeat has it all though. Ups, downs, it's an emotional, action-packed roller coaster. And while Spider-Man does seemingly die, so seemingly does Norman Osborn as well in the end. So while this is a defeat, there's also at least some poetic justice felt in the end too. But goodness, Aunt May, whew. Boy, do I feel for Aunt May here. Oh, it's so awful. Number 10, Sentry. And the circle of people getting ripped in half continues. It's a vicious circle indeed, let me tell you. Sentry is often actually a perpetrator of this kind of gruesome and brutal death, but this time around, he was on the receiving half of this murder method. This all went down during the King in Black event. When Null first arrived on Earth, Sentry was one of the first heroes to attempt to stand up against him and defeat him. Being the Sentry, he egotistically assumed he would easily be powerful enough to defeat Null. While Sentry tried to rip him in half, it was Null who managed to get a solid enough grip on Bob Reynolds to tear him asunder. Sentry would then be escorted by Valkyrie, aka Jane Foster, to the halls of Valhalla. And while on their way there, another shocking revelation would come to light. That some of the Valkyries were still alive, trapped, but alive, and upon being found by Jane and Sentry and freed, were able to kind of return once more. Pretty cool. It should be noted too that Sentry's death and defeat was also so shocking because it took place in issue number one of the King in Black series, in essence being one of the defeats that kicked off this event. Electra. You could say that Electra was a victim of the well-known daredevil villain Bullseye, but you could also say she was a victim of Frank Miller's gripping and at times very dark writing. In issue number 181 of Daredevil Volume 1, we watch Electra and Bullseye square off in a bloody battle, which ultimately ends in Bullseye spearing Electra right through the stomach and out her back. It's a really brutal event that changes Daredevil as a character entirely from that point on. And it's important to remember that in 1982, which is when that issue was released, a death like this for such a well-known hero wasn't quite as common as what we might be used to today. And it's not like she was resurrected again either, which is usually how this type of thing goes. She is completely done in the Daredevil timeline, only showing up in her own limited series and a couple other comics here and there. Number eight, Batman. 
Batman. Although it doesn't seem surprising on paper, when Batman was seemingly killed by Darkseid, it caught a lot of folks off guard. That is because Batman is such a mainstay. He isn't a character that dies often, and definitely not in a way that feels as permanent as this if he does die. Although the idea of Batman being killed by Darkseid might not seem that surprising, because I mean, Darkseid's pretty OP, Batman actually had a pretty decent plan for taking the villain out, and actually was successful using a Radeon bullet. Batman successfully hit Darkseid in the chest, but not before his Omega Beams could do their work. Although it seemed as though Batman was obliterated as a result of being hit by the Omega Beams, it turned out that what had actually happened was a power called the Omega Sanction, which is also kind of what Darkseid's Omega Beams are. And those had been used to transport Batman back through time, so he would return, but not before having weird time travel adventures. Wolverine While Wolverine has faced his death at the hands of Sentinels before, which actually results in his death, sort of. I figured that I would cover one of his defeats that doesn't really end in his death, but I'd say it's even more shocking and brutal, so here it is. It's when the Punisher shoots Wolverine in the face and then decides to run him over with a steamroller. This shocking and quite ridiculous defeat takes place in the Punisher number 17 and is rather uncalled for given how brutal it is. Wolverine is just sort of intervening in one of Frank Castle's missions, which to be fair, Wolverine does do a lot but it doesn't constitute shooting his face skin off and then flattening him into the ground with a steamroller. It's just a rough scene to witness and I think the Punisher needs to apologize. Number 6 Tim Drake Recently Robin, Tim Drake, had a big glow up. He came out as bisexual and was celebrated in his very own pride issue. However, even the fact that the character seems to be coming up more into his own and uplifted for his sense of identity could not protect him from an awful demise that was just around the corner. Enter Batman issue number 125. Here Batman and Robin go up against Penguin and come face to face as well with Clayface. But what makes it even worse is while they were attempting to evacuate a charity gala whose attendees lives Penguin was threatening, Robin got taken out by a goon with a gun. Just a goon with a gun. Ugh, brutal. While Robin would be stabilized, it was pretty shocking to see a character who had recently been so celebrated for identity and diversity taken out so easily and on the brink of life or death. Also, note to self, never attend a charity gala in Gotham. It pretty much never ends well. Captain Marvel, or Marvel, the dude one. This is sort of a sad entry because he isn't defeated by any one villain, nor does he come back from it like some others may on this list. The culprit in this case is actually cancer. I don't know what happened in 1982, but this event was also published in 1982, like the Elektra thing, and was actually known as the first graphic novel to be released by Marvel. It was called The Death of Captain Marvel, of course, and it chronicled the adventures of Marvel venturing into a dark dimension where he's exposed to compound. 13, which is a nerve gas that gives him an incurable cancer. He's then visited by friends on the planet Titan, even getting a courtesy convoy sent over by the Skrulls, who pay their respects in his final moments. The craziest part about this is that Captain Marvel doesn't ever come back, save for one time when the Grandmaster brings him back briefly as a kind of ghost, but other than that, he's known to be out of the comics for good after this one. Sad. Number 4 Captain Kate One of the most shocking defeats and demises happened not really to just Kate, but also to Lockheed. Poor Lockheed, not Lockheed, leave Lockheed alone. This all went down in volume 1 of Marauders from 2020. At the end of issue number 6, Kitty Pride faces off with Sebastian Shaw, who while considered to be a mutant who is allied with the nation of Krakoa, and so in that respect is technically a hero, I guess, has also a history of being a really nasty villain. And that is exactly what he was up to here. He kills Kate in cold blood by exploiting her weakness that at the time she struggled to phase through Krakoan organic material and gates. So he found some fast growing vine pods and unleashed them on her while trapping Lockheed in a net which he then dropped into the sea and then promptly sinking the boat she was aboard. One of the worst things about this too is Kate is even like, look, you can have all the seats on the Hellfire trading company. I, I don't care, just please let me save Lockheed. And Shaw's like, mm, no. <laughs> Considering that Kate was basically the main character of this series who possibly could not be resurrected, it was pretty shocking at the time. 
I was shocked. I was very shocked. At number three is Superman. Back in 1992, a comic book called The Death of Superman was published in which Superman is actually killed by Doomsday. The battle rages on for quite a while against this hyper adaptable villain with Superman showing serious signs of exhaustion as Metropolis gets more and more damaged. This being a multi-issue publication, the actual death of Superman takes place in issue number 75, which is quite a while into the series. And while it's easy for us to find that issue online today, Back then, readers were waiting months to see what happened to their favorite Kryptonian. I mean, with a title like that and leaving the event right to the end, I sort of rank this as more of a publicity stunt than anything else, but whether there is marketing involved or not, there's no doubt that this event was a shock to fans, who at the time were unsure if they'd ever see another Superman comic again. Thankfully though, but also sort of expectedly, DC then released Reign of the Superman, which chronicled the return of the hero and is known to have sold just about the same number of copies as the death of Superman. Number two, Green Arrow. Green Arrow's death was quite startling because he was basically uh, kind of the person behind it. Rather than do something, he sort of just let himself be killed and defeated. And I know there's probably gonna be Oliver Queen fans in the comments they are gonna be like, no, he sacrificed himself. But look, it just seems a little silly to me, okay? While beaten by the enemy, he also just kind of gave up. This all went down when Oliver Queen was blown up by a bomb that threatened to detonate upon arriving in Metropolis. Rather than let that happen, or give up his arm, which was stuck in the detonator case or chamber, he decided to just surrender and sacrifice himself to save innocent people, allowing himself and the plane he was in to basically be blown up. The really crazy part of this story is that Superman was right there, and while he wasn't coming up with any amazing ideas, other than one that would cause Green Arrow to lose his arm in exchange for his life, which Green Arrow was definitely not willing to do, Soup still likely could have done something else that would save Metropolis and Ollie and likely have allowed him to keep his arm arm as well, because after all, this is Superman we're talking about. If only he'd had the time to think of something better. It is hard to think of things on the spot, especially when, you know, a bomb is about to explode. So fair enough. Finally at number one, we have Peter Parker. I only don't call him Spider-Man in this entry because firstly, this is the Earth 1610 Peter Parker, and secondly, because he's from the Ultimate Spider-Man series. And either way, the Spider-Man mantle is still very much alive, obviously. But this is still one of the most brutal and unexpected defeats for any superhero, partly because Peter Parker is still only a teenager in this issue where he meets his fate. That and partly also because his final battle takes place right outside of his house in front of his friends and family. Facing off against the Sinister Six in a multi-issue battle, Peter is entirely helpless, getting ravaged over and over again by the group of villains. And no one really comes to his rescue, other than Aunt May, who actually takes out Electro with a revolver. Spanning between issues 156 and 160 of Ultimate Spider-Man, this loss takes its time and ends with deafening silence as Aunt May and MJ cry over Peter's dead body and the series just ends. It's a rough defeat that some people forget about, maybe because it's not from our dimension. But hey, it's still a young Spider-Man dying at the hands of a huge gang of bad guys, no matter which way you splice it. Number 10, Werewolf by Night. One of the first appearances of Moon Knight actually involved a two-part fight with none other than Werewolf by Night. What a brutal introduction to the Marvel Universe. This fight turned team up took place in Werewolf by Night issue 32 and issue 33 in the 1972 series. The first series of Werewolf by Night. Here Moon Knight made quick work of Werewolf by Night, not just tormenting him with punches, but also with scathing insults besides. How rude. However, while Werewolf by Night appeared to be no match for Moon Knight, in the end the hero decided to lay down his arms, realizing that Werewolf by Night wasn't the villain he'd thought he was, and the two instead decided to team up to take on a common enemy that had actually turned Moon Knight against Werewolf by Night in the first place. Number 9, Midnight. Although Midnight would go on to become a villain in the comics, originally he was actually simply the son of a villain who wanted to become a hero himself. Midnight is Jeff Wilde, the son of Midnight. Midnight Man. Moon Knight fought against and defeated Midnight Man, and Jeff ended up confronting Moon Knight as a result. But in the end, Jeff decides to actually work with his father's enemy, wanting to become a hero like Moon Knight, and ending up as his sidekick for a time, until he appeared to be disintegrated by number 7 of the Secret Empire. Not to be confused with the Marvel event Secret Empire. This is a group, not an event. Midnight, however, would return and end up fighting Moon Knight, Spider-Man, and a team of heroes, wanting revenge on his former partner, who he believed had abandoned him after his supposed death. 
Of course, Moon Knight probably just thought he was dead, but you know how it is when you're not actually dead. And you're like, you, you should have known that I wasn't really dead, man, even though it looked like I was disintegrated. This version of Midnight was a cyborg who had also been trained by and kind of brainwashed into joining the Empire. In the end, Midnight was defeated by Moon Knight with some pretty vital help from Spider-Man and the convenient assist of Empire's headquarters collapsing. Yay. Although I don't think that was the end of Midnight. I think Midnight uh, may have even come back after that, but yes, don't quote me. And friends, before we move on to our next spot, just a quick reminder, if you are loving Moon Knight and you wanna learn even more about him, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Then we can give you more Moon Knight lists. Number eight, Dark Hawk. In the Infinity War event, Moon Knight got to take on a slew of evil doppelgangers of heroes, including Dark, Dark Hawk. A lot of these fights are short, but it's neat to see Moon Knight take on so many alternate versions of Marvel superheroes at once. For those not familiar, Dark Hawk is Chris Powell, once 18 who stumbled upon a mysterious amulet and was forever changed by it, becoming the hero Dark Hawk. The amulet allows Chris to swap his consciousness with that of the Dark Hawk android, Shi'ar tech melded with magic, which comes with super strength, speed, durability, flight, a form of self-healing, concussive blast, and more. In the end, Dark Dark Hawk proved no match for Moon Knight, who made quick work of him by smacking him with his adamantium staff, or truncheon, if you will. That's what he prefers to call it, truncheon. I think I'm saying that right too. It's not trunch eon, is it? Probably not. I've never used a truncheon myself, but that's just based on how it's written, I'm assuming. Number seven, Daredevil. Daredevil and Moon Knight have fought one another in a team up where Moon Knight came out on top thanks to the bombardment of loud noises and his adamantium truncheon before deciding to work together. But he's also squared off with Daredevil's evil doppelganger as well in his Infinity War tie-in. Here, Moon Knight has some help from other heroes, but also ends up being the one to take down evil Dop DD as well well as a whole slew of others who gang up on him in the end. Though thankfully, he is shortly thereafter joined by some reinforcements as other heroic colleagues show up to help with basically the army of evil doppelgangers that are wreaking all kinds of havoc still. These doppelgangers, they never end, they're endless. Number six, Black Knight. Another evil doppelganger that Moon Knight comes up against during the Infinity War tie-in is Black Knight. Now granted, this isn't the real Black Knight, but it is a version of him. Black Knight and Moon Knight squaring off is also something that is just neat to see because they're both kind of like opposing knights in terms of design at least. Black Knight is a medieval inspired knight dressed all in dark, Dane Whitman who typically fights with the ebony blade, and Moon Knight is an Egyptian inspired mummy looking dude dressed all in white and here fighting with his adamantium staff. Though Moon Knight fights with a slew of different weapons as well in the comics. Number five, Deadpool. Wade Wilson is known for being pretty unstoppable with his healing factor and his rad merc moves, but not so unstoppable that Moon Knight can't stop him. These two duke it out as a result of a misunderstanding in Vengeance of Moon Knight, issue number seven, and fought once more in the next issue over a difference of vigilante ideologies in issue number eight. Moon Knight both times makes pretty quick work of Deadpool, not being able to fully kill him, of course, because of his healing factor, which is kind of just what Moon Knight wanted and needed anyway in this fight. Someone he could go all out on without the fear of killing them. So it's kind of a perfect match. The other thing that makes these two going head to head so interesting is the fact that they both have their own mental health issues and both are known for hearing and talking to voices in their head, which makes for some pretty cool moments and pretty fun dialogue. As different as Deadpool and Moon Knight are, they share a lot of similarities as well. There's a lot of like neat overlap there, even though they're very different. Different, but similar. Number four, Beast. During his Infinity War tie-in, Mark Spector Moon Knight issue number 43, Moon Knight also faces off against an evil doppelganger of Beast, aka Hank McCoy. The battle ends up being more tricky than when he faced Black Knight. Moon Knight actually has to employ some quick thinking to beat Hank's evil alternate, and it seems that both are evenly matched momentarily, with both applying lessons they are learning about one another in battle to their tactics. However, in the end, Moon Knight manages to out-strategize even the evil version of one of the most intelligent X-Men members. After Moon Knight defeats Beast's evil counterpart, Hank himself congratulates him for his quick thinking, complimenting his style. Real Hank, not a evil Hank, just to be clear. Number three, Black Panther. Well, really, Moon Knight survived a fight with Black Panther, but just as it seemed he was defeated, he did get back up and end up with the Phoenix Force merged to him. So 
I think we can call that a win for Moon Knight. If a fight ends with you getting an insane level of power like the Phoenix Force, you're winning, at least in the long run in my mind, even if you had to take a smackdown on your way to getting said power. These two duke it out in issue number 36 of the 2018 Avengers series, which I believe is considered volume 7. Moon Knight seems convinced that Black Panther is not himself, but is actually Mephisto, and fights against his Wakandan teched out suit, as well as Black Panther's own fighting skills, prowess, and power behind said suit. In the end, Black Panther ends up knocking him to the ground, but decides not to end Moon Knight. However, Moon Knight is then still able to finish his prayer and is rewarded with the Phoenix Force, which bonds with him, making him nigh invincible. Number 2. Spider Man Moon Knight ends up facing off against Spider Man after mistakenly believing he was the one responsible for a building being blown up. In truth, it wasn't Spidey behind the explosion, but the two still ended up duking it out on a rooftop. This happened not in the main continuity, but in the reality of Earth 1610. With 16 10 Peter and 1610 Mark Spector, aka Moon Knight. While Spider Man proved to be a pretty powerful opponent for Moon Knight, in the end, Spider Man still decided to run away rather than continue to fight the vigilante. So I think we can consider that a win for Moon Knight. I feel like he scared Spider Man enough that he was like, why am I even still staying here? I'm just gonna get out of here. I'm not gonna fight you. You're nuts. Number one, Captain Marvel. Captain Marvel is handily defeated by Moon Knight during the same story that Black Panther squares off with him in The Age of Khonshu. In issue number 35 of the 2018 Avengers series, he approaches Iron Man and Carol Danvers, aka Captain Marvel, attempting to take the baby star brand, Brandy Selby, from them. As Khonshu needs her power, catching Carol off guard, Moon Knight is able to restrain her quickly and then tosses her in the trunk of Ghost Rider, aka Robbie Reyes's car, which he he also has access to after taking Ghost Rider's powers. Carol is wrapped up in chains and also has to deal with what appears to be a tentacle monster in the trunk. Although she does escape, she ends up flying away, choosing to run, or rather fly from Moon Knight, then face him. Of course, she takes Tony and Baby Starbrand with her so they can regroup, but I'd still call making someone as powerful as Captain Marvel retreat a win for Moon Knight here. Granted, he is a very OP Moon Knight at this point in the story, because he's already beaten a lot of other heroes too. Which is why we should maybe do a part two to this list, because there's some that I didn't get to mention. Kicking off the list at number 10, The Ringmaster. Issue three of The Incredible Hulk back in volume one, we see the Hulk take on The Ringmaster. Will the mighty Hulk be a match for The Ringmaster? Well, apparently, yeah. He takes on a whole circus of crime who, might I add, do not have any superpowers, but right off the bat, the human cannonball gets the Hulk quite good. The human cannonball, just a regular guy with a makeshift hammer. This dude's spine would fold on impact if he cannonballed into the Incredible Hulk, so, so already I'm upset. And then it gets worse. A regular guy with a fireman's hose blasts the Hulk, and then he goes down, this time for good. I mean, I know the Hulk's mind was being toyed with here a bit, but the fact that a crime circus was able to best him in the first place, not okay, not okay. Number nine, Doc Ock. In Eric Larson's 1992 Spider-Man run, issue 19 titled Revenge of the Sinister Six showed us a more powerful version of Doc Ock because he had new fancier arms. In fact, the whole crew had the jump on Peter at this point. He was for sure in need of backup. And right on cue, the Hulk smashes through the floor, just sending wood chips all over the damn place. Already such a mess. And he's coming in hot too. The Hulk says knock knock when he busts out of the floor. That is so badass. First he flicks Shocker out of the way, gives him the finger, literally. And then he tosses Mysterio back to sleep. And then when he goes to handle Doc Ock, he's caught off guard from his unbreakable arms with limitless power. Doc Ock had the upper hand, or four upper hands, I guess, in this case. And before we continue on with this list, if you wanna go ahead and give this video a thumbs up, that would be awesome. No sweat, but it does help us out quite a bit. I'm not gonna waste any more time. Thank you so much for the best. Back to this list. Number eight, The Hulk Killer. With a name like that, you already know how this one's going to end. Created by Sam Stearns, the leader, Hulk Killer first appeared in Tales to Astonish, issue 86. Some detectives are going through the leader's notes. They're finding out that he's created these humanoids, but the Hulk destroyed them all, all but one. 
This humanoid was built specifically to take down the Hulk. So the cops call in General Ross, they figure this ought to be an asset in some way, shape or form for the government. But if only they could bring it to life because you know, what would possibly go wrong? So they bring him to life and it all goes wrong. He just leaves, he walks right out of the building, not even phased one bit by the bullets, of course. Then the Hulk arrives, they battle it out and they break their surroundings, but Hulk Killer just simply absorbs all these hits. Next, Hulk Killer beats Hulk so hard, he reverts back into his banner form. It's embarrassing. Number seven, Juggernaut. Kane Marco has been one of Marvel's biggest and baddest since his first appearance in X-Men issue 12. Once Marco came into contact with a gem, he then obtained the power of the Crimson Bands of Sidorak, becoming a human Juggernaut. Literally. The Hulk on average can beat Juggernaut, but in Incredible Hulk issue 402, Hulk bumps into this Jack dude who he realizes is not just an ordinary construction worker after all, rather it's Marco. Hulk thinks he has him. He tries to save Juggernaut's life after he falls into quicksand, but then he tries to pull Hulk in as well, so Hulk's like, all right, forget it. I'm gonna let you sink. See ya. Then of course he popped out of the quicksand and the beating continued and it kept going and going and the Hulk went down until he was almost dead. And that's when Red Skull stepped in and told Kane that that was enough beating for now. Number six, Zax. Making its first appearance in the Incredible Hulk issue 166, the thing from the dynamo was originally the result of an accident that happened at Edison Nuclear Power Plant. When a group of criminals tried to power off New York City, it went south, you know, the toughest gang in town, shutting down the power during Game of Thrones. That's truly, truly awful. Keep it up guys. So guns started blazing and it caused this massive chain reaction in the atomic reactor. And then this living energy then absorbed them and then soon took a humanoid form with a villain voice as well, of course. Zax absorbs the electricity from its victims' minds as well. So it gains their thoughts. Hawkeye comes in with a convenient foam arrow. In fact, Hawkeye's aim saved the day here, but they don't give him credit. They actually give the Hulk the credit, which is pretty rough. But don't worry, Hulk got what was coming from Zax when General Ross merged with the living energy and then beat down Hulk and Rick Jones. Ross was actually about to finish the pair off, but Zax's personality came back and then he flew off. That was a close call, Banner. A little too close. Number five, Brian Banner. The father of Bruce Banner was honestly a pretty horrible guy. He was he killed Bruce's mother, he's honestly pure evil. And he of course was locked away for 15 years afterwards. And then when him and Bruce reunited down the road, Bruce accidentally killed him. Yikes. Now this isn't the end of his story though, because during the Chaos War storyline in Incredible Hulk's issue 619, his dad comes back as a Hulk demon who would get stronger the angrier Banner got. Now obviously this is a traumatic experience, going down memory lane can hurt quite a bit. So this demon Hulk dad would have finished off Bruce if Jarella didn't step in to save the day. Bruce has the brain and Brian's got the pain. The banners are a wild bunch. Number four, Horfin. Born the offspring of a frost giant and Fenris, Horfin first appeared in the Incredible Hulk issue 422. When the Warriors 3 and the Hulk were going after Agamemnon, they followed them to Syngard Castle. Horfin was created purely to guard this castle. So now the Hulk has to fight a frost wolf. And this is pretty intimidating because when the frost giant Syngard himself unleashed his Horfin, the order was to kill the Hulk right off the bat. No warning, nothing. Just go, go eat him, bye, go. And it did, yeah. I did mention this wolf was incredibly big, right? What a snack. Number three, Pit. Image Comics introduced Pitt in Youngblood issue four. It was their version of the Hulk. He's an alien human hybrid created by the Creed as a literal death machine. So five years later, Marvel gave the fans the ultimate battle and released Hulk Pitt reality check. This was just 50 pages of punching and smashing and kicking. It's exactly what you would expect and want. But Pitt remained on top for the most part of this fight. And you gotta include Image Comics whenever we can. Cause Pitt is a treat. He's also drooling and jacked. He's just a nightmare. I would never want to deal with him. Number two, Thanos. This is the only movie reference in this list, but I do have to include it. The time Thanos punched the Hulk in the neck so hard that the beast straight up retired. Avengers Infinity War, directed by the lovely Russo brothers, before the title card even pops up in the movie, before it's like, bam, Avengers, the Incredible Hulk is gone. You don't see him anymore. He pops out and tries to get the upper hand on Thanos, and without even using the Power Stone, Thanos rock and boppers his neck. Now, we don't see the Hulk after this for five whole years. And even then, he's like taking selfies and dabbing. It's not the same at all. And finally, number one, 
Maestro. Maestro comes from an alternate future on Earth 9200, the future imperfect storyline. Now this takes place 90 years in the future and that Hulk had basically just absorbed all this radiation from our fallen planet over time. He gets stronger and unfortunately he also gets smarter. This isn't a dumb Hulk that gets, you know, hosed down at a circus. This is the maestro we're talking about. So our incredible Hulk goes to fight him, but on the way into the massive city of Dystopia, appropriately named, Hulk finds all these weapons and artifacts from all of our fallen and heroes. This new world was much harder to survive in, even with superpowers. And that's when Hulk meets up with his old friend, Rick Jones. Rick fills Banner in that basically everybody's dead except for those residing in Maestro's dystopia. He would keep the radiation level low enough for people to survive, but he would also keep it high enough for him to continue being powered up. Maestro ends up minecrafting his way to Jones' secret base, and the two Hulks come face to face. Now part two of the story is obviously just a massive fight. Maestro is terrifying. He calls Banner out on a bluff and then he just tosses a lady to smithereens. Like he actually doesn't care. He'll kill anybody in his way. It's terrifying. Hulk hits him where the sun doesn't shine and Maestro sneaks up and breaks his neck. Ending the battle and the story just like that. Number 10, Omega Red. While Omega Red has also lost to Wolverine in the past, he's also had his fair share of victories against him. Omega Red initially proved almost too powerful to Wolverine, especially when it came to the use of death spores which weakened him. There was a time when Omega Red successfully captured the hero and he only succeeded in surviving by getting help to escape, unfit to take on Omega Red alone. More recently in the comics, Omega Red surfaced wanting to join Krakoa, but he was actually revealed to be in league with Dracula. And and in fact helped Dracula to get his hands on Wolverine's blood, enabling the villain to walk in the sun. Since then, Omega Red has chosen to portray Dracula being truthful with the mutants and becoming their true ally, but Logan of course still finds it hard to trust him. He doesn't really believe he's the true ally. Perhaps because Wolverine himself remembers all the times that Omega Red has stabbed him in the front and the back and just basically stabbed him all around with his carbonadium tentacles. Number 9, Mysterio. Mysterio in an alternate reality completely defeats Wolverine and in the most horrible way. In the Old Man Logan continuity, Mysterio manipulated Wolverine, getting him to fight against and kill all the X-Men, explaining how this could have happened given all their amazing abilities by claiming that his friends would likely hesitate to take him out. Wolverine at the time thought he was taking on a bunch of supervillains who had invaded the mansion, and Mysterio also claims that Wolverine's ego is kind of blame for him accepting the illusion. After all, Wolverine believing that he could have possibly taken on all of these supervillains himself all at once does seem pretty arrogant. I gotta say, I kind of agree with Mysterio here. And friends, before we move on to the next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more lists where we get to tell you stories about people kicking other people's butts, I love telling these stories, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8, Sabretooth. Sabretooth has beaten Logan so many times that I've personally lost count. Sometimes it seems as though Victor's sole purpose has been to make Wolverine suffer. Case in point, how it became a tradition for Sabretooth to go and mess up Wolverine once a year on his birthday. Sabretooth has also been the mastermind behind a great deal of psychological plots to mess with Logan, including at one point pitting his son Dokken against him, forcing Wolverine to kill his own son. Wolverine thought this was how it had to be at the time, but he would actually later learn that it all happened due to the machinations of Sabretooth. People don't often think about how smart Sabretooth is, but he's pretty crafty. Number 7, Mystique. Mystique is one of those villains you don't want to underestimate because, well, it's really dangerous to do so. Case in point, why do I say case in point so much? Where did, where, who's been saying that to me that I've been putting this in my script? An example being when Wolverine thought he had killed her and would never see her again, only for her to return, having been resurrected by the hand, to get revenge on Wolverine for killing her. She not only defeated him in a physical sense, but also in a mental sense, using him to get information and also to mess with his head when she posed as Yukio. She really messed with him. But that's Mystique for you. Number 6, Spore. While Spore was an insanely powerful villain who did end up defeated in the end, it wasn't actually Wolverine that did the defeating in this scenario. Though he did fight against Spore, Spore appears in one of the earlier stories in Wolverine Volume 2 and was created by Archie Goodwin and John Byrne. It was an ancient entity who first appeared in issue 21, where we learned that the that was being used to increase the strength of Roundhouse at the cost of his sanity was actually a part of that villain, and that using that 
kind of how it infected its victims and was able to move more into the physical world through them. Spore, it turned out, was an ancient bioweapon created by the Deviants long ago that had laid dormant on planet Earth after requiring the strength of a celestial in order to be defeated the first time around. Although Wolverine struggled to defeat this enemy, the possibly mutant healer Sister Salvation managed to use her powers to defeat it, cleansing Spore permanently, but at great cost with her hands and possibly ability to heal becoming dramatically damaged afterwards. But Wolverine couldn't have done that alone. He needed he needed the Sister Salvation backup for that one. Number 5, Madeline Pryor. Another enemy who Wolverine likely wouldn't stand a chance against is Madeline Pryor. In the What If Inferno issue, we get to see what would happen if Madeline Pryor had won the day and she and Sim basically turn Wolverine into their little pet, unleashing his feral side and making him a complete monster. And I really do mean a complete monster. The hero doesn't even stand a chance against their influence as they help him to give in to the darker side of himself that he's always been working so hard to repress. It's even worse than losing a battle or his life because in this story Wolverine loses his morality and basically his humanity. I think that's worse. Is that worse than death? I think it's worse worse than death. If you like lose entirely who you are. Number 4, Dracula. Dracula is a long-standing villain for the X-Men and Wolverine. As we discussed earlier with Omega Red, the villain recently managed to best Wolverine by concocting a plan to capture him and use his blood to power up himself and his other loyal vampires, forcing Omega to become his undercover agent on Krakoa. Of course, in the end, Omega Red would turn against him, allowing Wolverine and the other mutants to strike back. But during that first story of the new series back in issue 1, Wolverine saw himself pretty heartily defeated at the hands of Dracula. And what made it worse is that he didn't really even understand at the time that he had been playing right into Dracula's hands. Number 3, Magneto. Magneto is of course another major supervillain who bested Wolverine. He was the one responsible for transforming him into a feral version of himself, stripping Wolverine of the adamantium that coated his skeleton. This was a huge part of us learning more about Wolverine's abilities and his power set. This is when it was revealed that his claws were actually bone claws and they were themselves coated. We also learned here that he had the capacity to be intensely feral. I mean, we'd always known that Wolverine had a wild side, a feral side, it had been a Alluded to in the comics, but we didn't know just how wild Logan could be. Don't worry though, although Wolverine lost all of his adamantium in the fight against Magneto and his nose, Professor X made sure that Magneto paid for what he'd done, and that he could never hurt anyone again by completely cutting off his mind, in essence kind of leaving Magneto still physically alive but brain dead. It should also be noted that Magneto has killed Wolverine many times across multiple different realities and timelines. Number 2, Apocalypse. Apocalypse is a villain that Wolverine has faced across many different realities, whether with a team or on his own. In some realities, Wolverine has managed to eventually win the war against Apocalypse, but has also lost battles here and there along the way. In the X-Men animated series from the 90s, we see no exception, as Wolverine attempts to take on Apocalypse alongside the X-Men. When it's his turn to strike, he completely misses Apocalypse with his claws, who manages to escape along with most of his horsemen. Kind of embarrassing. Number 1, Dark Phoenix. While Jean Grey would likely never want to hurt Wolverine, and he has honestly almost killed her on a few occasions across the multiverse, always to her benefit of course, usually, to avoid her having to suffer, when Dark Phoenix emerges, it's quickly made apparent just how much stronger this persona and force is in comparison to Wolverine. When the darker side of Phoenix Force makes itself known at one point during Phoenix Endsong, Wolverine doesn't stand a chance against it. In fact, he only survives his fight with the Dark Phoenix because he fits into her plan, with her aiming to use him as bait. It does seem as though he succeeds in weakening the Dark Phoenix, but once again, this seems to all be part of the Phoenix Force's plan, allowing her to take a more active role as she works towards getting what she wants, which she thinks at the time is Cyclops and his unlimited energy source, his optic blasts. But in reality, what Phoenix really wants is to feel whole again and feel loved. What a lovely little moral at the end of that story. Number 10, Clowned Around. Okay, we're going back old school for this one right off the bat. Kathy Kane entered Detective Comics in issue 233. She was a circus trapeze artist who turned into Batman, the usual, you know? She was a pretty big deal in comics. She was around from 1956 to 1979. So she was around for 252 issues. She was a part of the Bat family. So what happened? How did she go out? Was it heroic? No, not at all. How did a well-trained Batwoman get taken out? 
Well, let's answer that question. Now at this point, she was retired. She was still running a circus, but nonetheless, she was retired. She wasn't choking out bad guys anymore. The League of Assassins find her, and then it turns into this brawl, even with Batman showing up at one point. Now Batman is useless. He gets knocked out, and then when he wakes up, everything's done. The action's done. Kathy Kane is on the ground, holding onto her bat suit. And that's the end of her. That's the last time we see her. That is issue 485. That's the end of Kathy Kane. Okay. There's no big fight, really. There's no closing statement. She didn't save Batman's life. She didn't save anyone at the circus to, you know, it's just, we don't see it. Just a big L. Just a big old L. Readers were upset because all this time, and that's how you write Kathy Kane out, just to make Batman darker and to make his arc more cool and Gotham-like. Sure, okay. Number nine, Forgotten Foe. In Avengers issue 57, Vision joins the team. Now the issue is pretty deep because the team is trying to figure Vision out, where he came from, what his demeanor is, all that jazz. All he knows is that Ultron created him to attack the Avengers, which is pretty threatening from a guy who can walk through walls. So we start asking Hank Pym what he knows, but Amnesia makes that a difficult task. Now he finally remembers what happened. He remembers that Ultron started to become a problem. So Hank turned himself into Goliath to defend himself, but in doing so, he went super big and he hit his head off the ceiling of the room he was in. Because, of course, of course that happened. Hank's head versus stucco. He grew big and then he knocked himself out and that's why he couldn't remember anything. Honestly, it makes a lot of sense. Pretty embarrassing, but it checks out. And before we continue on with this list, if you wanna go ahead and give us a thumbs up, that would be super awesome. It's super helpful for our channel. You guys are the best, thank you so much. Now let's get right back to this list. Number eight, paint it yellow. All-star Batman and Robin, the boy wonder. The duo goes toe to toe with Green Lantern. And the trick here, if you wanna beat the crap out of a Green Lantern, is to paint everything yellow. If the Simpsons family got naked and fought Green Lantern, there's a good chance they might win. Green Lantern is surprised by this 12 year old boy's decision. He honestly undermines him. But readers were just surprised that he stuck around in the yellow room anyways. I mean, he just kept punching and he was kind of losing. Batman was beating him up a lot. And Batman was distracting him. So at the same time, Boy Wonder steals the power ring from Green Lantern. If you're not gonna use it, you might as well lose it. See ya. He then gets beat up even more. Like, dude, did they paint the town yellow or just this room? Walk into the room, be like, hey guys, I'll see you in the lobby. Good luck. Number seven, Robin's hurdle. So sure, Robin's pretty sweet being able to sneak the ring off and all, but what if I told you that athletic equipment stopped Robin dead in his tracks once before? Teen Titans, volume one, issue four, way back in the 60s. The team was curious when a young sprinter won a race to qualify for the Olympics, but he just kept running after, like he was cursed, which is pretty scary if you think about it. Imagine not being able to stop running like Forrest Gump style. Ooh. Scary. Now at the same time, Green Arrow sidekick Speedy needed their help as well because he was being attacked when he was practicing for some Olympic stuff as well. Some guy tried to sabotage his arrows. This organization called Diablo was behind it all. So there's a clear type of villain out here with a clear project. So the Teen Titans traveled to Tokyo just to make sure the Olympics went smoothly and Diablo met them there. He took the team down so easily and Robin gets caught because he can't break out of five loose hurdles. And that's it, that's the nail in the coffin. The entire team at that point is captured and put in the rings of the Olympics. And then of course, our guest Titan is blindfolded and is about to shoot a bunch of arrows. What a mess. Now eventually Speedy figures it out and the team is saved, but like Speedy had to save all of them. Number six, mugged with a crossbow. Green Lantern, Green Arrow, issue 85. This is so insane. Now the issue is front and center and it's talking about so already it's like a very aggressive issue. The first few pages, we see Oliver Queen walking at night and he's in a bad mood. There's some girl problems and some punks try and rob him. Now, it's not like he was tired. He didn't just come back from saving the day. He was actually in a pretty bad mood. Like I said, he had lady troubles. He was ready to fight. He was actually looking for a fight. He was glad they came along. Otherwise, he said he'd have to go home and punch the walls instead. Kyle style, you know? He was ready to go and he was fighting these punks off that were trying to rob him. And then one of them pulled out a crossbow because apparently it's Van Helsing and then, you know, muggers have crossbows all of a sudden. And then Ollie gets shot through the shoulder. He didn't even like regard the guy. He's like, oh, arrows, <laughs> I don't know my way around that. <laughs> like, it's still an arrow. You're still made of skin. Of course. Number five, Tony and Dr. Doom. So before we talk about this one, we're gonna fill you in a little bit on Doreen Green. She made her comic book debut in Marvel Super Heroes Volume 2, Issue 8, back in the early 90s. Now she was born with these squirrel-like abilities. Her name is Squirrel Girl. She has a tail. 
Right, you get it. She learned that she could communicate with squirrels at a young age, she was 10. So in an early comic book, she took on Doctor Doom at one point. In Marvel Super Heroes issue 8, she bumps into Tony Stark, and she's showing off, right? She wants him to see what she can do. It's pretty impressive for a pitch. Squirrels start coming in out of nowhere, it's like a musical, it's nice. And then she commands them all to jump onto Tony, and even he's impressed. He's like, wow, this is crazy. And then in comes Doctor Doom to make things even more crazy. Doom interrupts Stark's electronics, and just like that, Tony is out of the fight which was going to be my main point here. But in order to save Tony, Squirrel Girl had to send a horde of squirrels onto Doom's ship to get him out. That's how Tony Stark needs to be saved, a bunch of squirrels. Now these squirrels weren't part of the Avengers, they were just able to be controlled by Doreen. So no idea how these squirrels with little hands took down Doctor Doom. They didn't get a chance to fight. Doctor Doom saw all this and he was like, I'm out of here. The Avengers, I can fight. A bunch of squirrels? No, that's where I draw the line. And then Doreen later joined the Avengers in their 2017 run. What a time. Number four, Wolverine gets even more ripped. In our last video, we broke down some ultimate Wolverine facts and his super cool adamantium skeleton that isn't as strong as it is in our regular Marvel 616 universe. Now, it still sounds like a pretty good time. You have adamantium laced into your bones, like the Terminator almost. But one time, Magneto used that weakened adamantium against him. It's just as horrible as you're probably imagining. This all takes place during the Fatal Attractions event, and honestly, I got goosebumps reading this. The adamantium mixed with his bones wasn't that strong, so Magneto pulled the adamantium out and it was like water coming out of his body. It was loose, it was liquidy, and it probably didn't feel good. Professor X thankfully wiped his mind after he healed, which is great, but what about us? I need my mind erased after I just saw that. Are you kidding? I'm just gonna live my head rent free. Number three, The Flash vs. Turtle Man. The Flash is the fastest man alive, but in his debut comic, it was a bit of a rocky start for the Scarlet Speedster. In Showcase Issue 4, his powers are presented to him, he sees food in the air, it's a great time, it's super speedster. Now when Barry comes across the slowest man on Earth, the Turtle Man, appropriately named, it's actually quite challenging. It takes him a few tries, to get to him. Barry runs into a wall at first because there's a painting on it and he thought that was Turtle Man. So he runs into it Roadrunner style. He runs right through the wall. Bonk, okay, weird. And then the chase continues because Turtle Man gets in a rowboat and takes off in the water. But Barry doesn't have a boat, right? But no boat, no problem. Barry now realizes he can run on water. So now the fight should be over in at least three seconds. Barry still can't get a hold of this guy in a rowboat. He keeps running by him and he's just missing the boat. It's so infuriating. Now eventually Barry whips a few donuts around him, but I mean, it's not like the robo was doing zigzags. He was going three miles an hour, just straight. Number two, the punch. This one comes from Justice League issue five. Now in this comic, Batman came in to take over the Justice League International and Guy Gardner, Green Lantern, doesn't share the same enthusiasm as the rest of the team. He makes it pretty clear for more than one issue that he doesn't like this new leader. Although Batman is clearly a better fit, but whatever. So he got so upset that he challenged Batman to a fight without the use of his power ring. So Batman's like, all right, let's do this. And then Batman knocked him out with one punch. Blue Beetle got jazzed. He was like Joe Rogan at a UFC night. He was like, one punch, one punch. Oh my God, he was losing his mind. This is a great moment and a greater lesson. Don't take the ring off that makes you a superhero or else you're just a regular guy fighting Batman, literally. And finally, number one, Bruiser vs. Wolverine. Runaways issue 12, we see Logan and Molly Hayes, AKA Bruiser, have a rather quick fight. Now, at this time, Wolverine was a member of the New Avengers and he's trying to get to the bottom of what happened to Dagger. So he, Cap, and Iron Man went to find help from the Runaways, seeing as the signs were leading to Cloak being responsible. Now, Molly, right off the bat, okay, she's one of the strongest superheroes ever, but how she handled Wolverine was way too easy, especially now that he's an Avenger, like he's on the top of his game. So the big three walk into the cathedral, Cap calmly asks her to stop screaming and Wolverine and him are not going to hurt her. The screaming continues and Wolverine asks if she's heard of heightened senses, right? It probably didn't feel good. He gives her three seconds to stop drilling a hole into his brain. He counts three, two, and then the next page he was outside face down in the snow. Just like that. One hit, bam, he was eliminated. And then when he comes back in, he's actually embarrassed. I mean, fair. He just whispers how he won't tell anybody about tonight if they don't. It's kind of funny. Then he brushes snow off, but like, you're an Avenger, Wolverine. Come on, this is, you should have seen any of this coming. There you have it, guys. Some superheroes have an off day, okay? It's not just us. Coming in at number 10, we have Don't Mess With Batman. It will always be somewhat of a mystery as to how Guy Gardner is able to hold on to his lantern ring. The 
dude is kind of rude and childish, but I will admit he has pulled off some pretty impressive things as a lantern. He's just not what you would expect from a member of the most renowned space cops. And there have been plenty of times when Guy has crossed the line, like when he was forced to work under Batman with the Justice League International. Guy didn't think this made any sense. Why was a dude in a bat suit telling him what to do? Why was Guy Gardner not the one who was running the team? So Guy kept going on about how he should have been at the helm. He was whining, complaining, and insulting Batman. So Batman wanted to get everyone in order the fastest way possible and one punched Guy Gardner. He literally knocked the dude out, a green lantern in one shot. So if Guy had any questions about who should be in charge, they would have all been answered as soon as he woke up and put his nose back in place. This was hero on hero, but for Guy this was still pretty damn embarrassing to get floored from one shot. Coming in at number 9 we have the Lantern Club. I mean if I was a villain with super strength I would have done the same move. It's really killing two birds with one stone, or two supers with one super. If you flip open the comic countdown to Crisis Issue 3, you will see two heroes squaring off against one villain. In the hero's corner you have Troya and Hal Jordan, a powerful team up that would normally come out victorious. And in the villain's corner we have Mary Marvel, a villain that sounds like she should be in a straight to DVD Christmas special, but in this encounter she showed that she's no slouch. When she takes on the two do-gooders she quickly knocks down Troya and then snags Hal by his ankle and then proceeds to beat Troya with Hal using the lantern like a club. And just like that you have both of them bloodied and beaten. Really that was the most effective way to get the job done. Coming in at number 8 we have Spider-Man versus The Spot. The Spot will go down as one of the worst Spider-Man villains ever, but that doesn't mean that he wasn't able to get one over on Spidey. For those of you who don't know, The Spot is a villain that is covered with small portals all over his body. Think of him as the game portal, where you go in one portal and you come out the other, even if it defies the laws of physics. In their encounter, Spider-Man tries to punch The Spot and ends up clocking himself in the face. It was like a grade school bully going, stop hitting yourself. Stop hitting yourself. Coming in at number 7 we have Pants Punched and KO'd. Not all supers come from Marvel and DC so when I get a chance I'd like to sneak in some moments from outside the superhero norms. For this one we're going to head into the world of anime to one of my favorite shows, My Hero Academia. In season 1 we have the sports festival where new promising heroes go up against each other for the entertainment of the people. In this tournament we see Aoyama who has a belly laser power similar to Cyclops but it comes out of his stomach. He goes up against against Ashido who has acid powers. The two square off in a short scrap that ends with Ashido blasting Aoyama's belt line with acid. This causes his pants to fall down and Ashido slides in and uppercuts him unconscious. So getting knocked out while you're scrambling to pull up your pants, yeah that's one of the worst ways to go out. Coming in at number 6 we have packing on the pounds. You only have to look at comic books for about 4 seconds to get enough unrealistic body standards to give an entire generation of people body dysmorphia. So when one hero puts on enough pounds that he couldn't even use his powers, that really sticks out. Especially when your power is how fast you can move. I mean if this was to happen to the blob I don't think anyone would notice. Being big is kind of his thing. Who were we talking about? Well of course the Flash. When we zoom back to the silver age of comics we find an issue when one of the Flash's arc enemies, Gorilla Grodd, comes up with a plan to stop the speedster from running and it's simple but effective. He makes him get so fat that he can't use his powers anymore. Grodd zaps the Flash with a ray that makes him retain water without him knowing. This made him bulk up until he literally weighed a ton. It would be pretty embarrassing to go from the fastest man alive to the star of my 600 pound life. Coming in number 5 we have Wolverine gets a girl's touch. Known for being one of the coolest characters in the Marvel Universe, it must have hurt to have his body tossed through building after building from one shot from a 12 year old girl. In issue 12 of The Runaways, Wolverine is hot on the tail of Cloak. He eventually tracks down Cloak and lo and behold he's being protected by Molly Hayes aka Princess Powerful. He tries to negotiate but things turn violent pretty quickly. Downside for Logan is that Molly is probably one of the strongest mutants ever and with 
one touch, he's fired out of there like a snot rocket in the shower. Getting beat up by a girl must have not been the easiest emotional scar to get rid of. Coming in at number four, we have the yellow room. Lanterns are very particular about colors. Some are good, some are bad, and there's a spectrum, blah, 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 blah. While in All Star Batman and Robin, we see Hal Jordan get pranked, triggered, and beat up by his least favorite color, yellow. Batman is going out of his way to mess with Hal Jordan, decides to explore his artistic side and paint a room yellow. That's quite the statement. This, of course, sets Hal off when he walks in, but I don't think he was ready for what was about to happen next. A young Robin slips in and manages to pickpocket Hal's ring right off his finger, and then the teenager whoops his ass. Losing your ring, getting humiliated in a yellow room, and getting KO'd by a teenager? That is a rough one. Coming in at number three, we have Superman is trusting and dumb. Not how you would think to describe the Man of Steel, but when you hear how Lex Luthor was able to trick him, you'll be on my side. There was a comic where Superman is approached by a tailor, a guy who seemed to be a kind fellow who just wanted to do a good deed for the man who keeps the city safe. You can tell that this is an older comic. When was the last time a tailor approached you randomly and offered to make you a suit? Well, this mystery man offers to give the Man of Steel a brand new suit that will fresh freshen up his image. Superman thinks this is amazing and accepts. The tailor makes him this suit and without questioning anything, he puts it on. I think this might have been a case of superhero privilege. You think that you should be getting gifts from strangers at any time of the day. Well, it turns out this generous tailor was actually Lex Luthor in disguise. You think the world's greatest hero would be on the watch for the one person who's trying to kill him 24-7, but I guess he let this one slip. Oh, oh, and there's more. Lex Luthor planted a trap in the suit. He sewed a lead-covered clump of kryptonite into the suit, which Superman never noticed. He didn't take the half second to look at the suit with his x-ray vision. Nope, there's literally a bomb in his clothes that will expose him to his weakness at the worst moment. And it was given to him in person by his arch enemy. Lex Luthor would have had to put Superman through a whole fitting process, and he still didn't pick up on it. Coming at number two, we have Tin Can Iron Man. As time goes on, we have seen heroes and villains become more intricate the way that they fight, how they can be beaten, how they use their powers. For the most part, all of these things have become more exciting. But when some heroes were originally crafted, they didn't have such interesting pieces to them. For this slip up, let's head all the way back to Avengers number two. In this issue, the team of Earth's Mightiest Heroes has an enemy they never thought they would have to face themselves. Well, kinda. See, they take on Space Phantom. This is a villain who can copy any form exactly. There's literally nothing off about his imitations, and this was his plan to beat the Avengers by turning them on each other. This was Civil War before Civil War. At first, the Avengers are fooled, but then they learn his tricks, and while the Space Phantom is a perfect imitation of Iron Man, Thor is able to stop him by making it rain. And not in the cool way. He didn't throw a stack of cash in his face. Literally, rain comes down, and it rusts the perfect imitation of Iron Man so he can't move. I know some of you at home are going to complain because it was Space Phantom that was beaten and not Iron Man, but it was a perfect imitation of Iron Man, meaning that Iron Man could have also be beaten by Rust, which is one of the most embarrassing things that Iron Man could have learned about himself. And coming into the number one spot, we have the Justice League losing to Killer Frost. There's no shortage of villains that have ice powers. When it comes to Killer Frost, she's okay. She's never really had a moment to shine. She isn't really a villain that any S-tier hero would even bother with. She would be happy to see Elastic Man show up to fight her. But there was one time when her and the Suicide Squad were taking on the Boy in Blue, and Enchantress was able to smash Superman so hard he was laying on the ground immobilized. Soup has always had trouble with magic users. Well, Killer Frost was there and saw this as a golden opportunity. She used her powers to suck Superman's energy dry, draining him of his life force and his powers. She then flew off and took out the entire Justice League. Now, while it being hard for anyone from the League to take down someone that powerful, the fact that they let someone like Killer Frost get the drop on them, that is is pretty embarrassing. This is one of the biggest upsets in comic book history. Number 10, Batman gets punched out by Hal Jordan. Batman had a hard time getting along with the Green Lantern after his murderous incarnation as Parallax. The tension between these two came to a head in Green Lantern Rebirth when Hal decides he's pretty much fed up with Batman's paranoia and he just socks him one. A real mean right hook right to the jaw. Batman drops from the single blow, unconscious. Guy Gardner happens to be nearby, who Batman basically did the same thing to in Justice League number five. Just a one shot, boom, 
He's pretty happy to see Batman get what's been coming to him. It's certainly not Batman's worst defeat by a pretty wide margin, but it's definitely a serious blow to Batman's pride as well as his face, since he's basically just been knocked out with a single punch from a regular human. Then again, Batman doesn't exactly have like superpowered endurance or anything, so it does make sense that he could be brought down in one punch. What really gets me going is if Batman was so paranoid, why didn't he see this punch coming? World's greatest detective gets blindsided? And before we continue guys, if you want to go ahead and give us a thumbs up on our video because it goes a long way for us here at the studio. And if you don't do it, we're going to be really sad for like an entire year, so. Number 9, Jason Todd. A Death in the Family is a four part storyline written by Jim Starlin and published in 1988. And it's one of the biggest DC moments ever in comic history. This was a huge moment in the Bat story because we see the Joker beat the second coming of Robin, Jason Todd. And when I say he beats him, I mean he beats him like to death. Yeah, he gets a crowbar and then a bomb just to end it all off. And it's more than just a beating that's so horrible. The Joker also used Jason's birth mother. Yeah, he blackmailed her in order to get closer to Jason. And then of course the Joker killed her too. So this is a double whammy. All the defeats, all the feels, huh, our hearts. And what's even crazier about this whole thing is that it was up to the fans to decide his fate. Yeah, this actually came to life thanks to the producers allowing the readers to decide what happens next. There was a 36 hour period with a number you could call and vote for if you wanted the Joker to kill Robin or not. And it was pretty close apparently, something like 72 votes a difference, which is wild. Some fans even admitted to calling in more than once. You know, they just really, really wanted him out of there, eh? And this was of course a blessing in disguise because it brought us the glorious Red Hood who we can't help but love. Number 8. Spider-Man vs Mysterio When Mysterio first appeared way back in 1964, he gave Spidey a real run for his money. In this story, reports of Spider-Man robbing different stores in the night are hitting the news. Pete becomes pretty worried and thinks maybe he's going crazy, committing crimes in his sleep or something. He even considers visiting a psychiatrist at one point, but decides against it fearing that he might ruin his secret identity. Later, a costumed being calling himself Mysterio appears at the Daily Bugle and tells Jameson that he's a crime fighter and he's here to bring Spider-Man to justice. He vanishes in a puff of smoke, leaving a note telling JJ to publish a challenge for Spider-Man to meet Mysterio on the Brooklyn Bridge for a showdown. The battle that follows is a particularly bitter defeat for Spidey, as Mysterio uses his special effects expertise to counteract Spider-Man's webbing, causing it to melt, and messes with his spider sense using a powerful mist that deadens the senses and reduces Spider-Man's reactions. Spidey is also blinded by the mist. Afterwards, Mysterio has a great photo op with Jameson, being hailed as a hero for taking on the menace of Spider-Man. Spidey uses this opportunity to hit Mysterio with a spider tracer and follows him back to his base to learn the truth behind Mysterio's evil ways to eventually later defeat him. Number 7, Batman The Dark Knight Rises Directed by, of course, Christopher Nolan, who had done the previous two installments, comes a pretty epic conclusion to the hit trilogy. Released in 2012, The Dark Knight Rises, as you guess from the title alone, is about Batman rising up. But from where and why? Well, how about a broken back thanks to Bane, for starters? Yeah, this is eight years after the Joker had a run-in with Gotham City. So now Batman has to return to take down Tom Hardy as he mumbles and frowns aggressively around town. So after Catwoman walked him into a 1v1 in the tunnels of Gotham, we get one of my favorite fight scenes from any superhero movie ever. And what I love about this scene the most is that there's no music the entire time. All you hear is Batman struggling to try and make a dent on this guy. And it makes it more realistic. There's no heroic music above that distracts you, it's just stressful. It's so stressful, I mean you can see Bruce become more and more exhausted by the minute. Leaves you out of breath almost. And it all comes to a screeching halt when Bane picks up Bruce for one last blow, right to the spinal cord. Spirit! Oh, your money! 
Now, I know people give this movie a hard time, but seeing Batman get his ass kicked like this reminded me that it's not always the hero that gets the last punch. Because they belong to me. Number six, Wolverine crushed by the Punisher. The Punisher and Wolverine are a couple of rusty nails, real tough guys who don't take any guff and ask questions after the whooping is done. As such, when these guys go toe to toe in Punisher number 17 in 2001, they get straight to wrecking each other after a very short truce. They're both on the hunt for a guy who's been killing mobsters and leaving severed legs behind. Wolverine suspects the Punisher, and of course, Punisher's prime suspect is Wolverine. These two guys have a pretty nasty showdown that does not end well for old Wolverine. Punisher literally shoots Logan's face off and then blasts him right between the legs with a machine gun. Wolverine is doubled over in pain on the ground, as you can imagine, and Punisher, realizing he can't really stop Wolverine just by hurting him, crushes Wolverine underneath a steamroller and parks it on Logan's head with just his just his hands sticking out. Some very effective work by the Punisher and a seriously humiliating defeat for Wolverine. And number five, Spider-Man and Kraven. We take a look now at Kraven's Last Hunt, published in 1987, and it has quite an interesting illustration on the front page. We see a dark suit Spider-Man crawling out of a grave, covered in mud, and then in the background we read some alarming words on the tombstone, and it says, here lies Spider-Man. Huh, what? Okay, so this five-part series, of course, as you would guess, centers around the death of Spider-Man in a way. But how does such a thing happen to old Sticky Pete? Well, Kraven is frustrated after his failed attempts to catch Spider-Man, so he comes up with this all-new plan that involves him shooting Spider-Man. So Kraven buries him, and even worse, he takes a Spider-Man suit and then takes his place in the world. So not only do you get defeated, but also replaced, adding insult to injury. Literally. So then the new Spider-Man, our boy Kraven, now he roams in New York and brutally attacks criminals, including a group that was actually assaulting Mary Jane. So then two weeks later, Peter wakes up from the effects of the tranquilizer that Kraven used, and he digs himself out to freedom. Now, I've woken up late, maybe I've missed a class or two before, but I mean this, whew, this is just a whole nether level of stress. So when Spider-Man confronts Kraven, Kraven gets defensive. He's like, oh, no, 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 buddy. I'm the real deal now. I'm doing this. You, you go back to your little hole. I'm doing the Spider-Man thing now, right? Get out of here, bucko. And then Kraven releases Vermin, who is just huh, a bundle of joy to hang out with. He attacks Peter, thinking he was the same Spider-Man that had given him a beatdown before. And then Peter has to convince Vermin to cool her jets. Vermin is actually about to kill Peter until Kraven intervenes. I mean, talk about a messy two weeks, holy shit. Number four, Cyclops, Infinity War. Some of the heroes on this list got it pretty rough sometimes, and this defeat of Cyclops during the final battles in Infinity War is especially brutal. After Thanos had obtained the Infinity Gauntlet and performed his epic universe-altering snap, the remaining superheroes head off into space to battle against the Mad Titan. A lot of superheroes die, a testament to Thanos' epic power, but Cyclops suffers one of the worst deaths imaginable. Just as Cyclops uses one of his signature optic blasts, Thanos conjures an airtight, unbreakable cube around Cyclops' head, and, unable to use his blasts to free himself, Cyclops falls to the ground, suffocating in the cube. Captain America can't even break the cube open with a smash from his shield. A lot of the heroes who died in this event got it pretty quick. Even Cap is knocked out quickly with an epic backhand from Thanos that breaks his neck. This is a really tragic moment for all, but a super devastating defeat for Cyclops. I'm not even that big of a Cyclops fan, but the way this thing unfolded really made me feel for the guy. Number three, Magneto and Wolverine. Look, I bite my nails all right, a lot. I can't even pull a hangnail some days, okay? I, I, I grab it, I count myself down, and then last minute, I just bail. It's too spicy. I don't have enough willpower to do it. Now, I couldn't even imagine this next one, okay? I couldn't imagine if all of my bones got ripped out of my body at the same time. And that's exactly what happens to Wolverine when Magneto has had enough of his nonsense. So this all takes place during the Fatal Attractions event. Wolverine doesn't even have a chance to scream, apparently. The adamantium that bonded to his bones erupted outward like water bursting through a dam. That's how they put it. Ugh. And he's still breathing when this happens. 
I mean, if this isn't one of the worst things to go through, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, thankfully, Xavier wiped Magneto's memory and then Wolverine was out of commission for a while. I mean, he had metal spikes sticking out of his body, so I don't think he's getting any grocery shopping done anytime soon. Number two, Superman gets beat by Alfred. Injustice, Gods Among Us, had some pretty epic moments, like this crazy showdown between Batman and Superman that ends in a broken back for Batman. In this story, we visit an alternate DC universe in which Superman has gone mad and takes over the world as a dictator after witnessing the destruction of Metropolis by the Joker and accidentally killing his pregnant wife. It's enough to drive anyone mad, really. Batman tries to stop Superman, eventually forming a rebellion against Superman's regime. Both are joined on either side by other heroes who share their feelings, and a superhero war rages on. Sometime after poor Batman has his back destroyed, Superman is confronted by Alfred, who has recently taken one of the super-powered pills Lex Luthor invented for Superman to use to create a super-powered army. What follows is an epic and totally unexpected beatdown as Alfred gets revenge for Batman, <laughs> laying some serious blows on Superman with no remorse. Alfred cares deeply for Batman and he really lets it show here, hammering Superman's head into the ground. And number one, Vision, Infinity War. Okay, so Patty D mentioned earlier a pretty brutal death from the Infinity War comic, but if you're not aware of the comic, maybe you'll remember this one from the movie. So the Russo brothers made what's arguably the best superhero film to date. I mean, all of these characters who led their own franchise crammed into one single movie. I'm honestly impressed by how smoothly that movie runs. So we see Thanos as he walks his way through the universe collecting the cosmic infinity stones. First, he decimates Xandar for the power stone, and then gives Loki the old chokey for the space stone, even popping some blood vessels in his face at the same time. He momentarily turns Drax and Mantis into silly string and flesh cubes. And he throws Gamora off of a cliff for the Soul Stone and stabs Iron Man, forcing Strange to hand over the Time Stone. But they save the best and most heartbreaking for last, the Mind Stone. The stone that is Vision. So after a last effort attempt of removing the stone in Wakanda, his lover, Wanda, Scarlet Witch, is forced to destroy it in order for Thanos not to get it. So while holding back Thanos this entire time, she has to kill her lover. She does so successfully and we felt the pain. The theater sat silent as we tried to comprehend that this actually just happened. But then Thanos uses the most recent installment on his glizzy gauntlet, the Time Stone. He then brings Vision back to life in front of Wanda, grabs him by his neck as well, and then pulls the stone out, leaving Vision's lifeless and colorless body to plop on the ground. And what's crazy about this is that he wasn't even using another Infinity Stone to pull that out. He just digs through vibranium with raw strength and he plucks it out, again, like a hangnail. Crazy. Coming in at number 10 is Batman vs. Prometheus. This may be one of the silliest, yet coldest Batman takedowns I have ever seen. In fact, down in the comments, I want you guys to let me know your favorite absolutely wacky Batman takedowns. But for now, let me explain this one. The first time Prometheus encounters the Justice League, and specifically Batman, he overcomes them all, just showing how much of a force to be reckoned with that he is. As for how he brought down Batman in hand-to-hand -hand combat, the villain does what all villains do and gloats about how he did it. Using his helmet, he is able to program the skills of the 30 greatest martial arts masters in the world, including Batman himself, into his body and brain for his own use. Not one to be outdone like that though. When the time comes for the rematch, Batman cheats and forces Prometheus into using an older version of his helmet, but this version had been tampered with by Batman so that instead of the 30 greatest martial artists, Prometheus now has access to the physical abilities and skills of none other than Professor Stephen Hawking. Now Batman could very easily punch the lights out of Prometheus who is stuck with muscular neuron disease that renders him a drooling catatonic. God, it's, it's almost offensive, but it's just so good and such a Batman thing to do, like outthinking his opponent like that? Mm. Ah. Number 9, Magneto versus the Red Skull. Magneto and the Red Skull are on opposite sides of history. Magneto grew up in a Jewish family living in Germany during World War II, and we all know Red Skull and Hydra stance in World War II Germany. So, it's safe to say that these two villains will almost never get along. Right? In Acts of Vengeance from 1989, Magneto and Red Skull were actually 
temporarily united. But it's really important to note that Magneto was unsure whether this was the Red Skull that aided Germany in the slaughter of his people. So Magneto confronted him and the Red Skull confirmed that he was indeed the original, which was a mistake. It didn't take much for Magneto, the master of magnetism, to overpower the skull. But unlike what you might think, Magneto does not take his life. Instead, Magneto leaves the skull isolated in a stripped down fallout shelter 20 feet underground. He removed the ladder from the escape hatch, gave him 10 gallons of water, took out his homing transmitters, gave him no food and no light, just water, air, and his own depraved thoughts. Number 8. Peter Parker vs. Kingpin If there's one thing you just don't do, it's messing with Aunt May. After Peter had revealed his identity to the world, his past villains were all coming back to get some more personal revenge. This put his family in danger, and despite his best attempts to protect them, when an assassin tried to bring him down, he dodged out of the way and Aunt May happened to be in the line of fire. This transitioned immediately to the Back in Black Spider-Man arc, which saw Peter don his black spider suit and go on a warpath to find out who was responsible for hiring the assassin. Eventually, Peter learns that it was none other than Kingpin who hired the goon. Fisk was in prison at this time, but using an extremely large stash of cash that he somehow had hidden within his prison furniture. I don't know, it's a comic book, just roll with it. Fisk was able to get out of his cell, release the other inmates, and get about halfway through the prison before Spider-Man came crashing in. And after letting Kingpin monologue a little bit, he proceeds to lay an incredible beatdown on the Kingpin of crime in front of an entire prison wing of his underlings. But then, to make it much more personal, Spider-Man takes off the black suit to show that it, it's Peter Parker beating the snot out of Kingpin. Then he slaps the hell out of Fisk, threatens to spin webbing down his throat, and then explains how pathetic he is in front of all of his underlings, striking right at the Kingpin's massive pride. Number 7. Jericho vs. Vigilante Joey Wilson, aka Jericho, is technically usually a superhero, despite being the son of Deathstroke, one of the world's best assassins. The same serum that gave Deathstroke his powers and enhancements also gave Jericho his powers, but they differ largely from Deathstroke's. Jericho has a very unique and powerful ability that allows him to transfer his consciousness into the body of another and take control of them by making eye contact with that person. Unfortunately, Every time he did this, a small shred of the individual psyche remained in his head. At first, it was nothing that he couldn't deal with, but over time, possessing multiple people, he had so many psyches running around his head, it drove him insane and put him on a warpath that needed to see him brought down. The rogue anti-hero known as Vigilante was the one to take on the responsibility of stopping Jericho. But because of Jericho's sister insisting that Jericho was a good person at heart and should not lose his life, Vigilante decided to not deal with this threat in a completely lethal way. No, instead, Vigilante just completely took Jericho's eyes from his head. Blind and unable to use his powers, the threat of his abilities was gone. But I'm pretty sure it did nothing to stop his mental instability. In fact, it likely made it worse. Number 6. Wally West vs. Inertia Inertia was a young, villainous Thaddeus Thawne. Inertia is to Bart Allen, aka Impulse, what Eobard Thawne is to Barry Allen. He is his reverse. Now, Inertia had been raised his whole life to absolutely despise speedsters of any kind. He learned to be a villain from others, but his actions were all of his own. So when Inertia made the mistake of taking the life of his opposite, Bart Allen, he would be made to suffer the consequences. Unfortunately for him, those consequences came in the form of Wally West, one of the most powerful speedsters Ever. After taunting Wally about the fact he just took the life of his sidekick in All Flash number one, Wally takes the young villain who had the potential to be reformed, mind you, and removes his ability to move at all, traps Inertia in a museum as one of the exhibits, only able to blink once every hundred years, and leaves the kid there still thinking in real time during all of this, meaning he's driven slowly and pretty surely insane. And just as the cherry on top, Wally left him facing the exhibit of Bart Allen, the man that Inertia could have been. It's an incredibly dark fate for a hero to impose on a villain, especially one that small. Number 5. Superman vs. The Joker The Injustice video game and comic books took the simple premise of an evil Superman and turned it into an awesome story with really cool moments. The designs created for the heroes are mostly really, really cool and only slight variations of their best looks. The reasons that heroes and villains choose sides against one another is also really, really cool, and it gives some of the most ridiculous shows of force for Superman himself. 
But it all kicks off with one simple event. The Joker decides that he has become bored of Gotham, so he turns his gaze on Metropolis. The dark and twisted games that this character plays work really well with Batman, who is in reality just a normal human named Bruce Wayne. But when the Joker has to face someone with actual power, he's exponentially way more likely to come out on the bottom. So when he decided to crack Superman by tricking the hero into ending the life of Lois Lane and then blowing up a large part of Metropolis, he does succeed for just a few hours until Superman shows up in the room where the clown is being interrogated by Batman and Superman just bursts in, ignoring Batman completely and in one cold move he plunges his fist straight through the Joker's chest stopping his heart immediately. And number 4, Midnight vs Commander. The Authority is a really, really cool group from DC Comics Wildstorm universe. The two most well known heroes from the team would be Apollo and Midnighter who are basically like Superman and Batman respectively. Only these two are husband and husband, and Midnighter is almost insane. He is like Batman, but like Batman who is also mixed with the Punisher and maybe like a bit of Deadpool. And these stories get dark. In Mark Miller's run on the Authority, a villain by the name of Commander makes the very big mistake of attacking and forcing himself on Apollo. This was a hell of a mistake because in response to those actions, Apollo, after recovering, burns Commander's legs so that he can't escape and Midnighter shows up with a jackhammer. And the rest is something we are kept from seeing. If you want to check it out for yourself, you may be my guest, but you've been warned it is quite haunting. Number 3, Captain Cold versus Johnny Quick. If you have not read Forever Evil, I highly recommend you do. It's such a dark and crazy story that sees the villains of the DC Universe step into the heroic side to take down an evil Justice League from the alternate reality of Earth 3. Each member of this crime syndicate of America is a sick and twisted perversion of their prime Earth counterpart. But of all of them, Johnny Quick, the stand in for The Flash, may be the most messed up. He's a completely deranged serial killer in his world. And one villain just can't stand for someone dragging the Flash's name in the dirt like that. Leonard Snart, Captain Cold. In their confrontation, Mr. Quick gets a hold of Cold's weapon, the Cold Gun, and then gloats about how he had taken the life of the alternate Snart on Earth 3 and how Captain Cold is defenseless without his finger on the trigger of his weapon. Well, it turns out that Snart singing Jingle Bells Batman Smells activates the Cold Gun voice trigger which then completely freezes Quick's leg which is when Captain Cold takes his big old right boot heel and completely shatters this maniac's leg. Have fun accessing the speed force now, psycho! <laughs> In a number two, Black Panther and the Skrulls. Wakanda, like the other fictional kingdoms of Atlantis and Latveria, is protected by a man who will do anything to protect his people. T'Challa doesn't really have the luxury of sparing those that would do harm to his incredibly advanced home. But Wakanda is also one of the number one places targeted when an invading force wants to take over Earth. So, taking those two facts into account, when the Skrulls tried to invade Wakanda to start their mission of dominating the world, T'Challa and his wife Storm of the X-Men left those aliens with a clear message. After tricking the Skrulls into inflicting pain on their own men for information, the Skrulls sent out their best warriors for the task of taking down the pair. But just as those toughest warriors are gone from sight, an army of Wakandan soldiers breaks into the Skrull ship and leaves not a single Skrull soul alive. While that's happening, those quote toughest warriors are turned into pulp by Black Panther with T'Challa using their blood to write quote, this is what happens when you invade Wakanda on the bridge of the Skrull ship, cold. Number 1, Constantine vs Dr. Fate. It's funny, I never really thought I'd see Dr. Fate as a villain, and in a way this isn't exactly that. It's more like the helmet of fate and Naboo himself is the villain. In Constantine Future's End, John has stolen the helmet of fate, who without a wearer is just a measly old artifact with one of the world's most powerful sorcerers trapped inside. Allowing himself to get ensnared by the helmet, linking John and Naboo's minds, John trapped Naboo in the auditorium of Anubis. He fairly challenges Naboo to prove that he has actually ever cared about anyone other than himself in front of the ancient Egyptian god. If Nabu wins, then Constantine dies and Nabu is free to do what he does. Despite his great deeds though, he can't actually prove that he cares about anyone. When Constantine summoned the helmet, it immediately started influencing people to come and claim the helmet and save Nabu. But Constantine had set up a man to subdue each person that was called by the helmet and when one person didn't make it, another would be called and then another and another and so on. Each person just being used as a tool by Naboo who didn't care what happened to any of them. He proves that Naboo doesn't give a damn 
and then Nabu is eaten by Anubis, just straight up eaten. Now it turns out, even the challenge was a trick. With Constantine making a deal with the demon Ifrit, who now inhabits the Helmet of Fate in the place of and sort of alongside Nabu, bargaining with those who choose to wear the helmet from this point forward. Coming in at number 10 is Daredevil versus Bullseye. Imagine being the guy who continuously gets his butt handed to him by Daredevil to the point that you've been saved and brought back to multiple times with enhancements and he still leaves you stuck in an iron lung with the ability to do nothing but stare and talk very quietly. Imagine being that guy, and in another act of attempted vengeance, you mastermind a whole evil plan to get your revenge with your limited communication abilities, and then in Daredevil Volume 3, number 27, this red suited man without fear unravels your plans and then makes sure the jar that's keeping you alive gets filled with a toxic chemical, leaving you completely blind. Well, that's what happened to Bullseye. As Foggy Nelson said, once the deadliest man in the world, and now all he will be is a living brain inside a flesh and bone coffin. That's terrifying. Number 9, The Hulk vs. Abomination. Abomination in the MCU was once an incredibly intimidating villain, and he still sort of is, but also like, kind of like a hippie, and kind of funny. In the comics though, Emil Blonsky is absolutely ruthless. General rule for the MCU movies for you right here. If you like a character, just imagine them doing everything they do, but like turn it up to 10 and then you'll have their comic book counterpart. Mostly. What my point is here is that the Abomination is psychotic, and the Hulk is way more brutal. So, when the Abomination took the life of Betty Ross using his irradiated blood, he was not getting out of it easy. When they come head to head in The Incredible Hulk Volume 25 from 2000, it's arguably one of the best Incredible Hulk fights I've ever seen. Emil comes walking out of the water, and before he even knows what happens, Hulk is on him like shrimps on the bobby. The ground around them almost instantly becomes rubble. The fight travels under water and through a dam, flooding a whole town, all the while these two green goliaths are in a close combat slog match. And then, Emil decides to taunt the Hulk, which is just dumb because it just makes him angrier, increasing his strength, and the Hulk absolutely pummels the abomination, laying on fist after fist after fist after causing minor earthquakes and leaving a meal on the edge of life with his brain exposed. It's insane. This comic really shows the relationship between these two on a level that's not really captured anywhere else, and you should read it just for their relationship, honestly. Number 8, Batman vs. Thugs. Have you ever played the Batman Arkham games? The combat in those games is absolutely fantastic, but it still leaves me wondering how many of these random street thugs actually survive after their interaction with Batman, because I doubt it. He hits hard, and he is pretty unforgiving about it. Which serves his whole point of instilling fear, sure, but I think because these nameless thugs are cannon fodder, they essentially get the worst beatings of most of Batman's villains, and we never hear from most of them again. So that tells you all you need to know. As an example, let's talk about a group of thugs in the All-Star Batman and Robin series issue number 7. Now this comic is written by Frank Miller, who seems to be able to get away with making Batman do Pretty much anything, I guess. Like, there's no rules with Frank Miller. Like, in the opening pages of the issue, Batman comes speeding into a group of armed thugs, foot first, maniacally laughing like the Joker, and talking in his head about how Gotham is full of cockroaches. He relishes in the fact that the criminals are so scared that they are disposing of each other accidentally, and then he sets fire to a bottle of bleach and tosses it into the criminals, blanketing them in fire, and then continuously beating the snot out of them while they're on fire. And then what happens next? You'll never guess because Black Canary pops up out of nowhere and these two superheroes just start making out and getting busy while the thugs are literally barbecuing in the background. Unfortunately, yes, this is Batman, but not my Batman. Mm -mm. Number 7, Superman and the Manchester Black Beatdown. What's so funny about truth, justice, and the American way? I don't know. But what I do know is that the Superman story that uses that question as its title, also known as Action Comics issue number 775 for any of you who want to know, is awesome. Essentially, this comic sees the arrival of a group of heroes called the Elite that fight crime but in an incredibly bombastic and brutal way with no regard for lives lost. This flies directly in the face of the moralities of heroes like Superman and Batman, but apparently not. The leader of this band of villainous heroes goes by the name Manchester Black, and he has an incredible level of telekinesis, able to punch a hole in a mountain with a simple thought. He is incredibly capable, and so are his 
team, fixing problems before Superman can even get to the scene. Now, eventually, Superman, attempting to stop them from operating using such brutal forms of justice, gets his butt handed back to him during one of their first altercations. But that was Superman with the gloves on. As fast as a speeding bullet, Superman takes down the other three members of the elite, leaving only Manchester Black left. Now, in a move colder than I've ever seen before, Superman subtly uses his heat vision through Manchester's eye and cuts the connection between Chester and his telekinetic powers. Essentially, he lobotomized Chester using his heat vision, taking the ability to use his powers at least until the JLA could arrive and he left the elite in an unconscious dog pile. Number 6 Magneto Beating Apocalypse Magneto and Apocalypse are two incredibly powerful mutant villains with frighteningly similar goals, and yet we never really fully see them teaming up. But we also rarely ever see them fight either, except in the Age of Apocalypse reality. In this world, the mutant Legion had gone back in time in an attempt to bring an end to Magneto, but he inadvertently caused the passing of Xavier, his father, which led to a world where Magneto forms and leads the X-Men, and Apocalypse has nearly taken over the whole world. This all came to a head in X-Men Omega. Now, on paper, while Magneto is powerful with a capital P, when compared to Apocalypse, he should be a walk in the park for the second mutant to ever exist, and their fight goes going on simultaneously with about 3 or 4 other little skirmishes is intense. It's full of great lines, crazy twists and turns, but the best part is right near the end. Apocalypse has Magneto on the ropes and he gloats in his own glory, wondering why the master of magnetism isn't fighting back. Now staring straight into Apocalypse's eyes, Magneto says, I can't, I'm concentrating. And then they both look down to see Magneto's hands at his abdomen as he completely rips Apocalypse in two straight down the middle in the most awesome looking panel I have ever seen. It's so good. Number 5. Invincible. Invincible, Mark Grayson, is an incredibly strong character. Being a Vilchermite, Invincible is a member of one of the most unbeatable species in the galaxy. Mark is also a young adult, who hasn't learned how to control himself or his powers completely. So, it's interesting that one of his greatest enemies is an incredibly squishy man by the name of Angstrom Levy. That's because Angstrom is pretty intelligent and ruthless, but also because he has the ability to open portals to alternate realities. Using his knowledge of other dimensions, he was able to figure out the alter ego of Invincible and find out where Mark lives. He travels to Mark's home and then captures Mark's mom and brother. First of all, making things this personal never works out for a villain, so they need to stop doing that. But Angstrom does actually put Mark through a good old fight, using portals to send the hero to multiple different dimensions, which was really cool, honestly. Where Levy made a big mistake though was when Mark's mom, Debbie, decides to try and attack the villain using a lamp, smashing it over Levy's big old head. Levy didn't take too kindly to this little affront and he broke Debbie's arm. Now in a fit of absolute blinding rage after seeing this, Mark charges full force at Levy and they end up crashing through multiple realities until they land in a sandy desert wasteland. Which is when this idiotic guy Levy decides to threaten Mark's family again. Invincible, still in this blind rage, uses all the strength he has, completely pummeling Levy until Mark looks like he's covered in ketchup and angst is now a huge puddle, but somehow he still comes back. Number 4 Conquest Yes, we're still talking about Invincible. For the Viltrumites of this Invincible comic series, they have extremely high resistance to damage, but what makes them even more capable is that when they do get beat down, usually by another Viltrumite, and they survive the damage, once they heal up, they become even stronger than they were before. It's why the oldest Viltrumites are usually the most powerful of the bunch. Now one old timer Viltrumite goes by the name of Conquest, and he is one grizzled old man. Battle scarred as hell with a cybernetic arm and psychotic as hell as well, he arrives on Earth to check on Mark's progress with taking over the planet. That's a whole long story, we don't need to get into it. Essentially, he arrives after Mark had just gone through some sh**. I can't say that. So Mark is not in the best mood, but Conquest does not care, and these two have an absolute slog of a battle over the course of four issues of the comic. It's Insane. Conquest takes a few hits, sure, but Mark is no match for this guy in the slightest. In an attempt to help Invincible, his girl, Adam Eve, decides to show up on the battlefield and lend a hand. And she was far out of her league, but she's very powerful. Didn't really matter. Conquest punched a hole right through her. This was the line that you just don't cross. It sends Mark into a frenzy. 
The two Superman-like beings fly straight at one another and Mark punches straight through Conquest's cybernetic arm, breaking his own arm in the process. He uses his unbroken hand to clock the old man in the face. He bites a massive chunk out of the guy's shoulder. Adam Eve revives herself out of nowhere, lends a helpful blast, and then when Conquest breaks Mark's other hand, this guy uses his head and headbutts Conquest over and over and over again. It was like 15 hits until what was once his head is now a stomped on can of crushed tomatoes. I don't know if we can even show this one, but it's just insane. Number three, Squirrel Girl versus Doctor Doom. Look, we're talking comic books here, okay? Just Keep that in mind. In Marvel Super Heroes number 8 from 1992, in one corner, we've got the full, untested, unbridled powerhouse of Squirrel Girl. And then, in the other corner, we have the Fantastic Four's top enemy, the ruler of Latveria, the man who has wielded the power of the Beyonder, constantly blends incredible technology with powerful magic and artifacts, fueled by his massive, deserved ego. It's the one and only Dr. Victor Von Doom. Who's the winner? Obviously, it's Squirrel Girl, what the hell? Summoning a monstrous horde of squirrels that completely swarm Doom as he cries out, My much vaunted technology decimated by these gnawing rodents. And he escapes through a trap door, diving into a river and leaving behind his mask, which Squirrel Girl takes as a trophy. Of all the defeats on this list, this one is definitely brutal. Completely tore that man's pride straight from him and sent him running and screaming with a whole cacophony of squirrels. Damn. That was kind of fun. <clears throat> Number two, Mr. Dumpo. I know, I'm surprised that Punisher has not shown up on this list too, until now. Honestly, I can tell you why. The Punisher doesn't really have that many memorable villains because his whole thing is that he doesn't let them live. Usually his villains are gone from existence by the end of the issue and definitely before the end of the series. And usually he does it very quickly and very easily, but definitely not always. In the Punisher volume five, number 11, the Punisher is facing off against a guy called the Russian who was hired by another bigger bad who we talk about just, just in a moment. When the two finally come face to face, the fight sees them tumble through Frank's apartment building, crashing into the apartment of Frank's neighbor, Mr. Dumpo. Mr. Dumpo is not the smallest man. In, in fact, I'd say he's quite large. Yeah, that's how I'd put it. Using a fresh out of the oven, scolding hot slice of pizza belonging to Mr. Dumpo, Frank burns the Russian's face, and then Frank then takes Mr. Dumpo and tosses him on top of the Russian and dog piles on top suffocating the Russian to his demise. Could you imagine going out like that? Just take a moment and think about it. That would be horrible. Number one, Ma Nyochi. That's how I'm gonna say it. I said we were about to talk about another Punisher villain, and I wasn't lying. Ma Nyochi, or Nyochi, or however you, tell me how you pronounce that in the comments below, just, I can't figure it out. She's the head of the Nyochi crime family, so yeah, she ain't really a nice lady. Now, before the moment I'm about to talk about, Frank had thought that he had already neutralized the threat of old Ma here, and that's because he literally fed her to a gaggle of polar bears. Now, while they didn't finish her off, the bears did happen to relieve Ma of her arms and legs. It was that action that prompted the hiring of the Russian at the last point. Now in the Punisher volume 5 number 12, after taking down about 80, yes, 80 of her thugs, Punisher comes back to finish the job. 80 men were already obliterated, so no one was willing to lend the legless and armless head of crime a hand as Frank burned down her mansion. She put up a decent fight with no limbs though, sort of, after she attempted to gnaw his ankles off, unsurprisingly unsuccessfully. Frank uses his big old foot, plus the muscles in his leg, and not so gently places this helpless, horrible woman into the burning pyre that used to be her home. Cold. Or hot, actually, cause fire. Number 10, Blockbuster. Just like the video rental store that lives far off in a warm place in some of our memories, the villain of the same name, Blockbuster, met a very swift and some could say unjust end. Blockbuster may be a relatively unknown villain to some, and that may be due to the fact that he was primarily a Nightwing villain operating in Bloodhaven. In a tragic series of events, Blockbuster's mother passed away, and Blockbuster blamed this on Nightwing. He set out on a campaign to ruin the hero's life, attempting to take away anything and anyone that mattered to Dick Grayson instead of trying to hurt Nightwing himself. When Nightwing was at his absolute lowest in Nightwing 1996 number 93 from 2004, after a slog of a fight that moved out onto a fire escape, Nightwing had Blockbuster on the ropes when the new vigilante, Tarantula, showed up ready to bring Blockbuster to an end. Now, in a move I just did not see coming, Nightwing leaves his morals at the door, realizing Blockbuster will never stop, and
and he steps aside to allow Tarantula to end the villain's life. He then went and freaked the hell out while Tarantula started to seduce him. It was really weird, but it happened. Number 9 Spider Man vs. Fire Lord I think it is a well known fact that Spider Man pulls his punches. It's part of the reason he is one of the best heroes, but I always forget how much he actually pulls those punches. For example, in The Amazing Spider Man issue 270, a black suited Spider Man puts one hell of a beating on a former Herald of Galactus, Fire Lord. Previously, Fire Lord had been wandering the cosmos when he stopped in New York to enjoy the uh, culture, I guess, only to be attacked by firemen and then kicked in the face by Spider Man. Now, the Lord of Fire wants his revenge. After leading Fire Lord on a merry chase through office buildings, Grand Central Station, the subway system, into a construction zone, having a building demolished on top of the fiery villain, and then leading him to a gas station which explodes, Spider Man, at his wit's end, musters all his effort and his spider sense to lay an incredible beatdown of speed, agility, and raw strength on Fire Lord, getting so lost in his bloodlust until Captain America and the Avengers show up to be like, dude, you got him. Chill out. And in at number 8 is Deadpool vs. Bullseye. Reading through issue 11 of the 2008 volume of Deadpool just made me remember why I love Deadpool. Not that I forgot or anything, but man, he's just nuts, which makes it so good when the foe he faces is almost just as bonkers as he is. This time, it's Hawkeye, but not actually Hawkeye. It's actually Bullseye dressed as Hawkeye because this is happening during Dark Reign. And that's a long story on its own, which maybe we should do an attempt to explain of that at some point. For now though, Bullseye slash Hawkeye has been contracted to take down Deadpool. In the last issue, he managed to get an arrow right through Mr. Deadpool's noggin. So, in this issue, Deadpool takes it out and his brain is still half regenerated as he tries to take on Bullseye at this meat farm. Now listening to his half formed brain, Deadpool takes cover into a meat locker and decides his best course of action is to quote, be the meat. And he suits up in a butchered pig, using it as makeshift armor. Wade charges Mr. I, who had conveniently run out of arrows, lands a good crack, rack, and a crock, and then takes a swift kick to the no man's land. The fight transitions to the kitchen where Bulls Hawkeye, or whatever you want to call him, comes at Wade with a buzzsaw and Deadpool wielding two meat hooks, trips, grips, and sends a hook straight through this fellow mercenary's chest. The dynamic between these two psychos is just a treat to read, but I'd honestly recommend just reading the whole of this volume of Deadpool itself. It's fantastic. Number 7 Storm and Emma Frost A bit of a lesser known rivalry between two comic book characters is the one routine of Aurora Monroe, Storm of the X-Men, and Emma Frost, the White Queen of the Hellfire Club. Now, Back in the day, Emma was a villain more than anything else, and during Uncanny X-Men 151 and 152, the White Queen ambushed Storm, using her telepathic powers to swap their bodies, and then enacted a plan for the Hellfire Club to attack the X-Mansion. Now, After a whole lot of kerfuffle involving Kitty Pride, Emma lost control of Storm's powers, and that gave Storm the opportunity to swap their minds back. Storm gets the tempest caused by Frost under control, then saves the White Queen from a massive fall, all heroic like, but being the villain, Emma tries yet again to attack Miss Monroe, prompting Storm to straight up smack Emma with a massive bolt of lightning. She flies up into the air, raging like the goddess she is, then flies back down, grabs Frost by the throat, and scares the hell out of her by almost taking her life before Wolverine, of all people, talks her back to morality. It's fantastic. I love Emma Frost, but I think because of this, I love Storm a little bit more. Number 6 Kingpin vs. Grey Hulk The Hulk is an an interesting character. He has gone through many changes over time, even having different identities than just his regular green, savage, smashy smash one. One of his first, when he was still a Grey Hulk, would be Joe Fixit. Joe Fixit is a persona of the Hulk who is a relatively intelligent Las Vegas mob enforcer. It's great. Well, this year, in 2023, he got his own series. Fixit is specifically the enforcer for the Barangetti crime family, and in the series, Mr. Barangetti's operation becomes the focus of a certain Wilson Fisk, aka the Kingpin of Crime, who is planning to strong arm a takeover. Problem is, you can't really strong arm anything when one of the people you're facing off against is the Incredible Hulk. The best part about Joe Fixit is the fact that no one seems to be able to work out that he is just another version of the Hulk, so he is constantly underestimated. Within the first few moments of Kingpin's 
meeting with Mr. Berengetti, the plan he had goes south very quickly, and he decides to smash the man's desk, which is when Mr. Fixit enters the fray. Fisk's goon is slapped aside like a piece of unwanted salami, and then Fisk, who has gone toe to toe with Spider Man, who, as we know from part one of this list, is usually holding back, comes bull charging at Fixit, who obviously tanks three blows without flinching before grabbing Wilson's fist, hoisting the massive villain over his head, and then throwing him through the floor into the casino, and then picking him up and slamming him down into the floor again, and then holding his arm hostage until Fisk says that the meeting is over in English, then French, then Pig Latin. Priceless. And at number five is Batman versus the Hyper Clan. This point is eerily similar to the Manchester Black versus Superman point on part two of Brutal Villain Defeats. In 1997's JLA, helmed by Grant Morrison, a team of superheroes shows up on Earth and begins fixing problems and completely eradicating supervillains, gaining popularity with the people that rivals the Justice League. The difference here is that this team of superheroes are actually white Martians. Unsurprisingly, the first of the Justice League to find this out was Batman himself, who managed to evade being captured unlike the rest of the League. Sneaking into the Hyper Clan's base, he managed to lure one of their members, a mortal, who he strung up with a little Batarang held sign that read, I know your secret. When three other members of the Hyper Clan showed up, Batman brought them down with a single match and a circle of gasoline, turning their one weakness to fire into his greatest ally, because he's Batman. Number four. Darkseid. Darkseid is not a character you mess with. He's incredibly powerful with an insanely capable mind and the ability to practically never pass away. Sure, we could talk about his defeat at the hands of Batman, but that's kind of boring. Batman's a regular guy, sure, but he's also Batman. What we want to talk about is volume 3, issue number 2 and 3 of this comic called Superpowers. This comic was made to go along with a toy line, so we already should slightly suspend our knowledge of what various heroes and villains are actually capable of for right now. Now, in the story, Darkseid's Omega effect had been dwindled to almost nothing thanks to Mr. Miracle, Tear, and Mr. Freeze. After being betrayed by his people, he winds up teleporting to Earth with the last of his energy. Now, covered in a cloak, Darkseid is forced to to rob a store just to find more clothes and remain unnoticed. But just after he does so, Darkseid is confronted by a pair of muggers in an alleyway. A pair of regular old human muggers who bully him, threaten him, and then knock him out cold with a chain just to rifle through his pockets and run off into the night. But the best part is how he looks up with a big Darkseid frown and goes, Oh, surely my plight can sink no lower. You never see Darkseid like this, and certainly not in a fedora and a trench coat. Mwah. Number three, Starro versus the Justice League. Despite how ridiculous the idea of a massive starfish looking alien that can control minds is, Starro the Conqueror is still one of the Justice League's earliest and most dangerous foes. All the way back in the Brave and the Bold issue 28 from 1960 is our first ever introduction to Starro. Now this was before he used starfish face huggers to control minds and instead would use a telepathic beam to control huge scores of people. When Starro did this to attack of people using one of his deputies, the Flash happened to take note of the fact that one kid, Snapper Carr, who was possibly the most annoying kid to grace the pages of comics, was immune to the effects of Starro's mental control. But it was a mystery as to why. It turns out that Snapper was covered in calcium oxide, aka lime, from when he was working on a lawn earlier in the day. Lime, used by oystermen to fight starfish off of their oysters, also happens to block the powers of Starro, curiously enough, and so Green Lantern grabs a bunch of barrels of the stuff from a nearby farm, and the Flash grabs bags and bags of it from a chemical warehouse, and they team up to proceed to absolutely cover Starro in lime, imprisoning the Conqueror in an unbreakable shell of lime. As it sets in the comics, a living statue of lime. Number two, Firestorm versus Parasite. Rudolph Jones found himself exposed to a strange form of radiation, which changed him into a bald, green-skinned parasite with the ability to absorb the life energy of of others. Well, in Firestorm, the Nuclear Man, issue number 86, Parasite is released from an area he is being held in and goes on a rampage, draining multiple people of their life energy, including Firehawk, who fell pretty easily to this villain. Now, luckily, the hero Firestorm is nearby. At this point in time, Firestorm has become the world's fire elemental and received a pretty significant power boost. Almost as if to prove this, Firestorm comes in hot on Parasite with a blast of flame, and then when Parasite tries to 
drain Firestorm's power, the hero is completely unaffected as he says, quote, My powers come not from myself, but from the earth. I don't have power, I am power. And in a last ditch effort, Parasite decides to try and trade energy blasts with Firestorm. Now, unfortunately for Parasite, it is nowhere near an equal fight. He uses up all of the energy he took from Firestorm, and then just trying to hold back Firestorm's blast, Parasite goes through his own reserved life energy until he is on the brink. Realizing he will lose, he begs Firestorm to stop, saying that Firestorm would bring the end for Parasite, to which Firestorm simply says, that was my intention. Luckily for him, Parasite was saved by the allies of Firestorm who told him to stop, but this hero left Parasite emaciated from using up his own energy. And finally, and at number one, is Joker versus the Red Skull. Now look, the Joker is a maniac, an absolutely insane criminal lunatic, but hey, he is an American criminal lunatic, goddamn. Which means dealing with someone with the past of the Red Skull is an absolute no-no. Yes, these two villains teamed up together in the Batman and Captain America team-up special, back when DC and Marvel actually got along with each other. Naturally, these heroes' two greatest villains team up to take them on. But I guess it turns out that even Joker is above the morals of a World War II era war criminal. The Red Skull hires the Joker to steal an atomic doomsday device, which the Clown Prince of Crime totally agrees to do, until he sees Red Skull waltz out with a certain symbol front and center on his outfit, indicating his involvement in WW2, which is then confidently confirmed by the Red Skull. This is when the Joker delivers the line about being an American criminal lunatic, and the two simultaneously attack each other, Joker with his venom and the Red Skull with his, quote, dust of death, which they are both immune to. This is when Joker gets smacked over the back of the head with a wrench, but eventually the fight makes it onto a plane where the Joker overpowers Red Skull and they both go tumbling down through the sky alongside the atomic device they stole, destroying them both in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Now I don't know if I'm more shocked at Joker's switching of sides, or the fact that they had a fist fight while straddling the top of an active fat boy. It could be either, I don't know. But coming in at number 10 is Jack Frost. When Jimmy Olsen was on a game show back in the Silver Age series Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen number 33, a special prism appeared randomly in a garbage dump that, for some reason, turned the thoughts of the game show contestants into reality. Just go with it, it's a comic book, okay? So, when Jimmy answered a game show question with Jack Frost, that's exactly who appeared. Jack Frost, as a villain, threatened to plunge the world into a new ice age. Now, I'm sure that's not at all what Jimmy had in mind, but luckily, he is Superman's pal. So, what was Superman's solution? Simple. He would just go fly into space and move the frickin' sun closer to the Earth. Not only is this an absolutely ridiculous feat, which is theoretically completely impossible, but it was incredibly embarrassing looking for Jack Frost, who had to run away from Superman, who was essentially chasing the freezing villain with the sun. Once Jack Frost had retreated into a deep, cold cave, Superman put the sun back where he got it so it didn't destroy the Earth. The bonkers part about this is that he did all this nonchalantly as if he was moving furniture. It's... It Number 9, Hank Henshaw. After Superman's infamous death at the hands of Doomsday and his not exactly surprising return to life, Superman had to clean up the messes made in his absence, including some imposter Superman. One of which would be the cyborg Superman, Hank Henshaw, that took over the role of Superman in his place. This cyborg wasn't really doing a great job with his Supermanning, and I think most would agree that he was really tarnishing the name of Superman. Because he was. Hank ruined Soup's memorial, and more importantly, he had just blown up Coast City, taking the life of millions of people. Now, when Superman actually returns from the dead, he doesn't have his powers back just yet, so the conflict actually lasts a little while. But once Superman gets his powers back, you best believe he beats this sucker, and in one page, no less. Hank is a cyborg, like I said, so Superman ends this guy by simply punching him straight through the chest and then using his super speed to shank him so fast his screws come loose and he just straight up falls apart. Superman shook this sucker to death. Number 8, The Marquis of Death. 
In 2009's Fantastic Four number 566, Dr. Victor Von Doom reveals to us and his people that he had learned almost everything he knows from one incredibly powerful reality warping villain called the Marquis of Death. With his master now on his way to see how Dr. Doom had fared as ruler over the Earth, only when the Marquis shows up with his mysterious new apprentice, he was less than happy with the progress Doom had made on Earth, and to punish his old apprentice, he attacks. The Marquis completely warped reality, making Doom think he had actually won the fight, and then snatched the victory away, set him on fire, turned his heart to stone and his blood to acid, and then sent him back in time to the Pliocene Age to be eaten by megalodons. Do you realize how insane that sentence is on its own? That should be the point right there. But over the course of the rest of the story, the Marquis goes on to fight the Fantastic Four, almost beating them. But he is brought to a point of nearly being beaten. Which is when, out of nowhere, his apprentice, the new one, shows up and slaps and destroys this reality warping villain. But not before revealing that he is actually Doctor Doom himself. Apparently, Doctor Doom survived being eaten by megalodons and being turned to stone and his blood to acid, gained enough power and dark magic to completely change his form, became the Marquis' new apprentice, even defeating Uatu the Watcher so he wouldn't be discovered, and he did all of that to hide in plain sight to get his revenge and finally defeat the Marquis of Death. If you guys are enjoying this list so far, make sure you check out the rest of the channel for parts 1 to 3 and maybe subscribe while you're there so you don't miss part 5 and all the rest of our comic book loving content. Thank you. In at number 7 is the Superman Revenge Squad. After discovering the planet of the Superman Revenge Squad, Superman wastes no time at all and charges at the planet with a full frontal assault armed with nothing but his abilities and a strange package attached to his chest. The Revenge Squad fires all their most dangerous, most powerful weapons at Superman, firing everything they think will take out the Man of Steel. They all impact on Kal-El and the villains think they've won for a moment. But when the dust settled, they didn't even leave a scratch. Instead, the package on Superman's chest detonated, encircling the whole planet in a layer of mist. Now, Superman then yells down to the villains from the heavens, explaining if any of them pass through the mist leaving the planet, they will suffer total amnesia for getting any hatred they have for Superman. They can remain trapped on their base, being angry and upset, or they can rejoin the cosmos devoid of all grudges. Either way, he doubts he will ever see them again, and then he just flies on back home. And in at number 6, Simon. Simon Jones is a villain of the Teen Titans who has vast telekinesis and telepathic powers, and he is also the leader of the Fearsome Five. All of that, but he basically just calls himself Simon, but, but, but cool because there's a P in front of it, so we know that he is a, a psychic, psychic dude, I guess. Cool. In Salvation Run number 2, Simon is among the new Injustice League when a bunch of villains, including them, get exiled to an alien world. Simon, who is standing among some pretty big name villains, attempts to convince his fellow supervillains that escape is impossible, and so he then proceeds to lay down plans for beginning a new civilization, involving all the female villains getting pregnant and giving birth as soon and as frequently as possible. But luckily, the Joker is also here, and he doesn't seem to be a fan. Joker very, very abruptly interrupts Simon, tossing a rock that hits the guy square in the noggin, and then running up and smashing Simon over the head repeatedly with a rock, assuming control. Number 5, Captain Boomerang. This brutal defeat is so quick and so abrupt, there isn't even much I can really say about it other than you should never put a captain up against a general. In 2016 Suicide Squad, in literally the second issue, Task Force X are sent on a mission to Russia to retrieve or destroy an unknown device. Well, turns out that the device is actually a portal. A portal to the Phantom Zone. Rather than leave it be, which would probably have been smart, Captain Boomerang approaches the portal and is almost instantly incinerated down to his ankles by none other than General Zod, using his heat vision. I doubt the Boomerang guy would have been able to help much in the squad's fight against Zod, and honestly it's a miracle any of them survived at all, but I never expected this to happen so abruptly and to one of the main members of the squad. 
And in at number four is Mr. Mixelpidilic. The villain known as Mr. Mixelpidilic is both incredibly powerful, but he also doesn't really do anything that bad. He's usually just a big old nuisance. In Superman Whatever Happened to the Man of Tomorrow, a whole bunch of Superman's villains all make their play on the Man of Steel. And when their threat is ended, Superman is still left wondering why the heck this is all happening, when he realizes the only villain that wasn't among them was the fifth dimensional imp himself, which is when he finally reveals himself. He goes on about how, being completely immortal, he gets really, really bored. He spent 2,000 years just floating around doing nothing, and then 2,000 years doing good deeds and being nice, and then he spent 2,000 years being a mischievous little imp, and now, of all times, he decides he's gonna start being evil, and his first evil act is to kick off the next two millennia well, by taking out Superman. That's basically what he says. But I don't think it was like that. Anyways, Mr. Mix reveals his horrendous true form and goes on the attack. Unfortunately, Superman's girl Lois Lane figured out what to do. Superman grabbed the Phantom Zone projector, and as he was about to use it on this magical imp, Mr. Mix spoke his name backwards, which would return him back to the fifth dimension. Unfortunately, this happened simultaneously, and Mixelpidilic was torn in half between both the Phantom Zone and the fifth dimension. And apparently, Superman did this completely on purpose, and then he runs off to go and sulk about it. Number three, Dinosaurus. The Viltrumites from the Invincible comic series are a race of near invulnerable, incredibly strong, world conquering aliens. But none among them stands as strong and as invulnerable as Grand Regent Thrag. Battle hardened over thousands of years, only the most powerful characters can even hope to stand mano y mano against this powerhouse. David Anders, the villain known as Dinosaurus, is not one of those characters. While Dinosaurus is very, very strong, it's more so his. His intelligence that is his greatest weapon. Dinosaurus allied himself with Invincible around issue 90 of the comic, and in an attempt on Mark's life by Thrag, Dinosaurus comes to Invincible's aid, which he had to know would not go well. Dinosaurus attacks Thrag, but his claws shatter like glass on Thrag's skin. Thrag then proceeds to pummel Mr. Anders, only stopping when he was distracted by an explosion. This brief moment of pause gave Dinosaurus the chance to chomp on the Grand Regent's head. But unfortunately, just like his claws, Dino's teeth also completely shatter, not even leaving a scratch on Thrag, which gives Thrag the chance to first mock the guy, but then break his jaw and leave him to think about his mistake. And in at number two is Vulcan. In recent years, the red planet that was formerly known to us as Mars has become home to a group of mutants known as the Iraqi, who renamed the planet to Araco. These mutants differ from the Krakoan mutants we know by years and years of a constant battle for survival. Because of that, the Iraqi are a warlike people. They despise weakness and take on almost any challenge as a means of strengthening themselves. Because of this, duels and challenges are a key part of Iraqi society. Now, the Iraqi are ruled by a group called the Great Ring of Araco, which is made up of almost completely Omega level mutants. One of those mutants is an incredibly disliked guy by the name of Tarn the Uncaring. Now another Omega level mutant who is also pretty unliked by a lot of people is a guy by the name of Gabriel Summers, aka Vulcan, who wields massive energy manipulation abilities, which he can use to take away mutant powers. The problem is, Tarn's ability is also to take away mutant powers. As part of a big convoluted plan, Vulcan challenged Tarn for his seat on the Great Ring of Araco, which all comes to a head in X-Men Red Issue 3 from 2022. Just as the fight begins, both mutants simultaneously negate each other's powers, turning their fight into a straight up physical altercation. At first, Vulcan gets in a few good hits meaning two, he gets two hits. But he didn't seem to take Tarn's face tentacles into account, one of which catches Vulcan's fist, allowing Tarn to land a face shattering punch. He then grabs Vulcan's arm with one hand and completely snaps it, then slams his face into the Colosseum floor and crushes it with three swift punches, winning the fight. And in at number one is Tarn the Uncaring. Ooh, surprise, you thought that was the end of the story. Well, nope. Right after Tarn has turned Vulcan into a floor decoration, he celebrates his win, exclaiming that he is unkillable, and asking who will challenge him now. 
and to his surprise, someone answers. You see, another powerful mutant who is also hanging out on Arako is none other than Magneto, who has been featured a few times in this series. Magneto comes floating into the Colosseum with his helmet and calls Tarn a stain on the planet, challenging the recently victorious mutant whose psychokinetic power stealing abilities have now returned. But if you think that will put Magneto at a disadvantage, you are sorely mistaken. Iraqi combatants are allowed to use weapons outside of their powers, and like I said, Magneto had his helmet, which, if you are unaware, blocks mental powers. Before Tarn even finishes his sentence to accept the challenge, Magneto uses his metal controlling powers to slam his helmet onto Tarn's head, blocking his powers from being used, and then, in one swift move, he crushes the helmet and Tarn's head like a can of pop. It's so fast and so ruthless, and it's the most badass moment I have ever seen. Mwah. Beautiful. Number 10, Iska loses in victory. I love this defeat because it happens in the form of a victory, which is pretty weird and pretty great. This takes place when Iska is challenged by the Fisher King to a battle of loss, in essence challenging Iska to see who has felt and experienced the most loss. In this way, the Fisher King kind of sneakily defeats Iska by making her step down from a direct battle after feeling the weight of all she has lost as a result of her powers. And the weird thing is, technically she wins the fight because she feels more loss, but in doing so she kind of loses in the way that the Fisher King wanted her to. Well, Iska's mutant power is to never lose, challenging her in this way basically ensures she will win. So having to feel and reflect on all the pain she has suffered and caused. As such, this causes Iska to leave Arako, planet Arako, unable to carry on, at least momentarily, in her fight against her fellow mutants and causing her to step down from her place on the Great Ring, which many people feel she no longer deserved as someone who so deeply betrayed Arako during their fight against Uranus. Even if it was, you know, her own powers that compelled her to do so. And you know, Iska's obviously done that before a few times. They were like, we're kind of over this. <laughs> Especially when Iska just walks in and is like, well, I'm back. Uh, I'm also helping you guys run this, right? I, I can't deny that I would also be like, Iska, get out of here. And friends, before I move on to our next spot on this list, if you love devastating defeats, whoo, you will love our Invincible playlist because Invincible is full of devastating defeats, <laughs> devastating brutal ones. So go check that out. Number 9 Karma comes for Alexander Luther. Alexander Luther is the one who pretty much set in motion the events of Infinite Crisis, a major mastermind behind it all. In the end, it only makes sense that from a hero standpoint, he would have to face, you know, some kind of justice, because that's how these stories typically go. And while initially he seems to escape pretty unscathed, at the very end of Infinite Crisis issue number 7, we see him come face to face with Karma in the form of other villains, Lex Luthor and Joker of the main continuity. While Xander seems to already kind of be in the process of putting together his next plan, he is accosted in an alley by the two villains and quickly defeated, with Lex asking him as he slowly bleeds out on the pavement, now who's stupid? I'm gonna spoil it for you, it was Alex, Alexander Luther, he's a stupid one I think is what Lex is getting at. It's like it's not me because now you're dead, so. Number 8. Thor goes for the head. This defeat is devastating in kind of a different way because ultimately after the events of Avengers Infinity War, the Avengers are left without hope at the beginning of Avengers Endgame. Here our heroes of the MCU go to face Thanos with the help of Captain Marvel. While they do succeed in locating him only two days after his fateful snap, which we all saw at the end of Infinity War, they still arrive too late. Thanos at this point has used the stones to destroy the stones, not something you can do in the comics but apparently something you can do in the MCU leaving our heroes without any foreseeable way to bring back those they have lost, because they have no infinity stones to do that with. Frustrated, Thor strikes out against Thanos, cutting off his head with a single swing of Stormbreaker and ultimately defeating him. Even more devastating actually, because with Thanos dead, our heroes are then left without any actual leads on how they might, you know, recover the stones and return those lost back to life. So it's a defeat, but it kind of is a defeat that leaves you going, well, now what? Number 7. Superboy Prime takes a toll. I love Superboy Prime, he's such a brutal villain. For this point, we are headed back to Infinite Crisis, where earlier on, in the same issue as Alexander Luther's death, Infinite Crisis issue number 7, Superboy Prime is fought against by Superman of the main continuity and Superman of the Golden Age, belonging to Earth 2. The Golden Age Earth 2. Kind of, I think there's a few Earth 2s at this point. While Superboy Prime is eventually brought to his knees by the combined efforts of both Superman and 
and the help of Mogo and the other Green Lanterns, the fight is an epic one that cost Golden Age Superman his life in the end, leaving Kara, Power Girl, all alone. Super sad. Truly, this is a really sad, really sad fight. Consequences. Uh, we love a fight with consequences. Number six, Magneto crushes Tarn the Uncaring. Oof. In a way, some might see this fight as one between two villains. However, at the point in history that we're talking about here, the era of Krakoa and Planet Arako, Magneto is not really a villain, and Tarn even is a bit ambiguous when it comes to his role and his alignment. Although, I would say, at the very least, we could consider him to be an antagonist. And myself personally, I actually do consider him, in fact, to be a full fledged villain because Tarn is, well, he's a pretty evil guy. Based on my perception of these characters, I'm including Tarn's defeat here, so that's what we're doing today, friends. At one point, Magneto challenges Tarn to battle, being backed up by Iska, who's kind of tricked into supporting the fight against Tarn by Sunspot. Magneto manages to defeat Tarn in only a few pages, using his helmet both to disable Tarn's telepathic genetic manipulation abilities and then to crush his head. Yikes. Number five, Wonder Woman takes a life. What have I learned from this story? Don't mess with Diana's friends or colleagues. Once more, returning to the story of Infinite Crisis, but this time, the beginning of it, the preamble, in issue number 219 of Wonder Woman, Diana is forced to fight against her longtime friend Superman, who is revealed to have been basically mind controlled by Maxwell Lord. Now, when Diana realizes this, she heads straight for Lord, but Maxwell refuses to give up his control over Superman, promising Diana that at some point he will successfully manipulate. Manipulate Superman into killing Batman or Lois or even herself. She refuses to accept this, and while Lord is, of course, tied up with her lasso of truth, she demands that he tell her how to free Superman's mind from his influence, which obviously he's going to be compelled to tell the truth about that. Maxwell responds with simply two words kill me. And surprisingly, Diana does just that, snapping his neck with her bare hands. Pretty surprising. Although I guess, you know, Wonder Woman is a, a warrior, so sometimes she do be killing people. Number four, Professor X creates an even greater villain. Time to talk about Fatal Attractions. This is the famous X-Men crossover story arc where Magneto uses his magnetism powers to pull out all of the adamantium from Wolverine. Terrifying to behold, but it inspires a possibly even more horrifying reaction from the X-Men's mentor and teacher, Professor X, who snaps after seeing this happen to Logan. He uses his telepathic abilities to completely wipe Magneto's mind, taking away, as he says, his greatest weapons, his hatred, his his ego, his nightmares, Magneto's mind, it's all gone. This would be the catalyst event that would set up Onslaught, a powerful psionic entity who would manifest as a result of the combined darker psyches of both Professor X and Magneto. A devastating defeat, therefore, in many ways, considering, you know, what it leads to much later. Onslaught, I feel like, just goes on forever. Number three, Starro reminisces on happier times. Oh, this one is truly brutal and devastating for me because, in a way, Starro was quite a misguided villain. This is like heartbreakingly devastating. In James Gunn's The Suicide Squad, Starro is cast in the role of antagonist, but Starro is not malicious per se, or at least not malicious without you know, cause. Starro is an alien who was captured and used for various experiments as part of Project Starfish. The Suicide Squad has been sent to basically shut down said project after the United States learned of how dangerous the project could be if unleashed on the world. When the team finally uncovers the truth behind Project Starfish, it's too late and they kind of accidentally unleash the captive, mind controlling cosmic being Starro uh, on the world, or at least on Cordo Maltese. Amanda Waller is surprisingly fine with all this as it will destabilize Cordo Maltese which actually benefits the US, so she's like, nah, that's cool. However, the squad decides to rebel against Waller because, I mean, there's a lot of destruction happening around them, a lot of innocent people being taken out, and they decide to take on Starro anyways. Thanks to a combination of commitment and luck, they manage to defeat Starro, but as they lay dying, Starro broadcasts their last thoughts, reminiscing on what their life was like prior to being taken captive on Earth, saying, I was very happy, floating, staring at the stars. Sad last words. Number two, Nova annihilates Annihilus. In Annihilation issue number six, we see one of the most devastating villain defeats of all time. Or at least, you know, one of the most devastating methods of defeating a villain, I would say. It's happened a few times this way in the comics, actually. And each time, it's still pretty devastating. Here we see this method used when Nova takes on Annihilus and defeats him by basically, like, ripping his spine out 
through his throat. Ah, uh, what a way to go. I don't even know if we can actually show this one on YouTube. I don't even know if I could say that on YouTube, but I did, so I guess we'll see if it makes it in the cut. It's just, it's that devastating of a moment. Number one, Peacemaker faces his dad. This one was a disturbing, heart-wrenching, and shocking moment from season one of Peacemaker, a series that surprised me in so many different and delightful ways. One such startling moment happens when Peacemaker is forced to face off against his dad, White Dragon. While we know pretty early on that Peacemaker's dad, Augie Smith, is pretty much the worst role model or parent anyone could ask for, we also see that Chris Smith, aka Peacemaker, still cares deeply for his father despite all the awful things his dad has done to him throughout his life. Rather than rightfully blame his father for his messed up upbringing, which honestly, he he should do, Chris seems to blame himself almost just as much, if not more, making the moment when he actually faces his father a pretty tense one. Years of pent up rage, disappointment, shame, and frustration manifest in a single instant when White Dragon goads his son into killing him, commenting on the fact that he doesn't believe his son is in essence strong enough or man enough to even do so, and in the process causing Peacemaker to snap, pushing him past the brink and resulting in, well, Chris doing just that, killing his own super supervillain father, pretty brutally too, so. Yeah. Number 10, Midnight Man. Midnight Man is an arch nemesis of Moon Knight, well known by dedicated fans. He is the father of Midnight, aka Jeff Wilde, who would go on to become a Moon Knight sidekick before becoming a villain himself. Midnight Man is Anton Mogart, who was given his mantle due to him stealing priceless valuables and works of art, committing the thefts at exactly midnight. He did not possess any superpowers, but was already himself a wealthy man, who stole simply because he wanted to and enjoyed the thrill. Eventually, he ended up being defeated and stopped by Moon Knight. As a result of their fight, he became disfigured, lost his fortune, and became kinda deranged, collecting garbage in the place of valuables. He teamed up with Raul Bushman to try and defeat Moon Knight, but of course, failed. When he discovered he had terminal cancer, he faced off with Moon Knight one final time, but once again lost and died in the process. While just a man, he was an extremely gifted thief and skilled combatant. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more Moon Knight lists, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. I'm so hyped for the series. Can't wait for all the Moon Knight stuff. Bye. Number nine, Anubis the Jackal. Sort of. This wasn't the Anubis, but was rather Ahmed Aziz, a man who had acquired Mark Spector's Conchu statue after he decided to give up being Moon Knight and sell it so he could settle down with Marlene. Aziz was actually believed to be the reincarnation of a Ramses, the ancient priest of Anubis. He sought to rule the world by becoming basically Anubis incarnate, and acquiring the statue was all part of his plan. He also attempted to eliminate Conchu's agent on Earth, Mark Spector, but failed. Spectre was then drawn back into becoming Moon Knight after Khonshu and his priests prepared him for battle, sensing that the statue had fallen into evil hands. Anubis the Jackal almost succeeded in defeating Moon Knight, but he survived their attempt to sacrifice him. In the end, Aziz was believed to have been killed when a freak sandstorm caused the temple he had built to collapse. Aziz wasn't a super long-lasting villain, but if he had succeeded in his plot, which almost happened, mind you, he likely would have been one of the most powerful powerful villains that Moon Knight had ever encountered. Number 8, Black Spectre. Black Spectre is like the reverse of Moon Knight. Carson Knowles is a man whose trauma turned him into a villain rather than giving him a disassociative identity disorder and turning him into a hero. He was a soldier who returned from war underappreciated for his service. His job was gone, his wife had left him, and his son sadly ended up dead. Knowles blamed the city for what happened to him and used his influence and his connections to run for mayor with sinister plans for the city once he was elected into office. When he wasn't focused on gaining the mayoral seat, he acted as the villain Black Spectre. Black Spectre was just a man, of course, but was cunning, military trained, and did look really badass. Whereas Moon Knight dressed all in white and was a hero, Black Spectre dressed all in black and acted as his antithesis. During a fight with Moon Knight, Black Spectre was seemingly killed when Mark had no other option when it came to how to stop him, causing him to fall to his death. Number 7, Raul Bushman. Bushman might not be the most powerful villain on this list, but he's definitely a meaningful one for Moon Knight. And despite not being an A-list villain by Marvel Comics villain standards, he would definitely make the A-list in Mark Spectre's book. Bushman was one of the first major villains Mark came up against at a time where he was basically transitioning into becoming Moon Knight, or to develop his Moon Knight persona depending on which way you, you want to look at that. 
Bushman was the one who basically killed Mark initially, which led him to being revived by Khonshu and ultimately becoming an avatar for the god. Although Khonshu would later be retconned to have made appearances earlier on in Mark's life as well. One of the most brutal defeats that Bushman suffered was at the hands of Moon Knight when he used one of his crescent darts to literally carve Bushman's face off. You can say what you want about Edgelord Moon Knight who surfaces in the 2006 Moon Knight series, but this still remains a favorite moment among many Moon Knight fans. Myself included, despite being part of a somewhat controversial period in terms of how the character was written. At least for me, I don't know. I'm sure there's lots of people that love the 2006 series all throughout, and if you do, that's fine too. Number six, Ernst. Ernst is one of Moon Knight's oldest villains when it comes to his in canon history. When Mark was still a child, he discovered a dark truth about Ernst, who he knew at the time as Rabbi Yitz Perlman, a close friend of his family. The truth was that Perlman was not who he claimed to be, but actually a World War II soldier deserved who had fought for Germany named Ernst and was basically posing as Perlman. Ernst wasn't just someone with a past, he was also a compulsive serial killer who believed that killing kind of helped him to preserve his life force energy and attain a level of immortality. He would go on to start a society known as the Society of Sadiq, a society of sadists who believed in Ernst's own ideologies. After escaping Mark when he was just a child, Ernst knew that eventually their paths would cross again in the future. Following Mark's life, Ernst saw in him great potential and intended to make him his heir. While successfully trapped and forced to take part in trials to prime him for acceptance to the Societe, Mark ultimately rejected Ernst. After being forced to roam the city with him as a final gambit to ensure that Mark became what Ernst intended, Mark fought even harder against Ernst's influence, ultimately reaching out to his other personalities and killing him. Well, his other personalities kind of killed him, but that's still Mark, so. It's complicated, but basically Mark was the one to kill him, still, if that makes sense. Number 5. The Truth The Truth became a follower of Ernst, but even though he was not the leader of this group and Ernst intended to use him as a pawn, The Truth definitely had more raw power in comparison, hence why Ernst saw him as being so valuable. The Truth is a newer Moon Knight villain who first appeared in legacy numbered issue 189 of Moon Knight. While we don't know much about his past, he is a villain whose powers allow him to basically expose the perversion of humanity to those around him or those he touches, showing them the truth, or a version of the truth. They see a twisted version of the truth, which can then corrupt their mind and can also make their face basically bleed, potentially even killing them if exposed for too long. I mean, you only have so much blood in you. Ernst had hoped to use Truth's power on a global scale, and Truth believed in Ernst's story and beliefs, even after Ernst was gone. However, Truth's powers appeared to be unable to infect the minds of those who are mentally unstable, which meant that Moon Knight could resist his influence and ultimately ended up defeating him. Number 4. Taskmaster Everyone knows that Anthony Masters is insane when it comes to hand to hand combat. He has photographic reflexes, which allow him to learn any fight move or style just by basically observing or battling against someone, which makes him pretty hard to beat if you don't have the same kind of crazy superpower set. While Moon Knight doesn't have any crazy superpowers, but he does have a Batman-like ability to strike fear into the hearts of almost all of his opponents, no matter how skilled they are. And it is in using this tactic that he is able to defeat Taskmaster. You could also consider that these two fighting at night would give Moon Knight a bit of a leg up, as it is also believed that Moon Knight becomes strong at night due to his connection to Khonshu. He's also kind of immortal due to his connection to Khonshu, but on paper he's still kind of a guy. Also, if it's a full moon, he gets even more powerful. And that night when they fought, it was a full moon, so... This is Moon Knight at his most powerful, in theory. Number 3. Moonshade Moonshade is Moon Knight's own evil doppelganger who was created by Magus during the Infinity War event in the comics. Moonshade, like the other evil dops of superheroes, was created by Magus. While we didn't get to see the full extent of his powers, he was able to reach out across the multiverse after absorbing some of Franklin Richards' power with the help of 
Franklin Richards' own evil doppelganger. He attempted to drain the life force energy of all the Moon Knights from across the multiverse, but in the end was defeated by a Moon Knight and Moon Knight Alt team up. Although not before he successfully drained many alternate Moon Knights of their life force energy, proving just how dangerous he really was. Number two, Mephisto. More recently in the comics, Mephisto has become a villain to both Mark Spector's Moon Knight and his god Khonshu. Khonshu was the one to alert Moon Knight of this rising threat and help him to prepare for the coming fight, which we see in Age of Khonshu. Considering that Mephisto is basically on a god tier level, being not quite a god and not quite the devil, but definitely Marvel's equivalent, one of Marvel's equivalents anyways, I think we can consider him to be pretty powerful. There isn't much Mephisto can't do so long as he can manage to play by his own rules. Really his only weakness is that he kind of needs to get his victim to agree to some kind of like contractual obligation in order to be able to really have power over them. Of course, Mephisto often has the ability to give or do exactly what his victims need, which is often what makes him such a dangerous and powerful villain. There's a lot of times people are tempted to make deals because Mephisto's like, I got everything you need over here. Just make a deal with me. It won't go wrong. It goes wrong every time, but this time it's gonna go right for you, my friend. Number one, Khonshu. In the end, Khonshu and Moon Knight successfully defeated Mephisto, but the battle unfortunately did not stop there. Once Mephisto was defeated, a greater threat rose up in his place. The very person or entity that had seemingly been trying to help Moon Knight defeat Mephisto in order to save the world from his villainy. Khonshu. Khonshu decided that now that Hell was uh, kind of open for vacancy, he would take over and also kind of turn the world into a Egyptian afterlife the hell thing. And that was when Moon Knight realized that his god had completely lost it. Teaming up with the Avengers who he himself had previously fought to defeat in order to arm himself for the fight against Mephisto, Moon Knight ended up defeating Khonshu. Now godless, Mark Spector is still Moon Knight but is only guided by his own moral compass and ideology, instead of Khonshu influencing him and his decisions. Bullseye and Deadpool. These guys are just perfect for each other. In Daniel Way's Deadpool, we got to see these guys duke it out multiple times as Norman Osborn has hired Bullseye to take out Deadpool, but it's not the quick and easy job he's hoping it'll be. Bullseye is operating as part of Norman's Dark Avengers, playing the part of Hawkeye, so he's got a pretty neat Hawkeye inspired costume. These guys have some great showdowns, including the first one that ends with Deadpool taking an arrow straight to the head. Somehow these guys just can't get enough of each other though and end up at each other's throats again real soon. In a super epic moment later in the story, Bullseye launches a missile at Deadpool, who happens to be driving a huge ass truck at the time. He Tokyo drifts the truck, whipping it sideways, and narrowly misses the rocket, which goes streaming right through the cockpit of the truck. It's a super awesome moment, and these guys have a nice laugh about it afterwards. This duo obviously has a pretty good time trying to kill each other, and that could be the reason that they never actually get the job done. Bullseye winds up having to pay Deadpool off in the end, which is pretty embarrassing when your whole thing is that you're a hitman who never misses. Hey guys, don't forget to take a second and hit that like button, it really helps us out here at Top 10 Nerd. Number 9, Thanos Arrested. Oh man, this one is great. In this issue of Spidey Super Stories, number 39, there's a story called Dog Day Afternoon, where we see Spidey and Cat team up to take on Thanos. The story opens with Thanos buzzing around in his Thanos copter, and then he's all like, whoops, drop the old infinity cube, while he's battling with Cat. The two part ways, each hoping to find the cube first, but instead some kid finds it, and it eventually winds up back in Thanos' hands. This leads to a spectacular showdown, chock full of hilarious puns. Seriously, these guys do not let up with the cat and dog puns in this story. Thanos winds up using the cube a second time, causing an earthquake, and the earthquake makes him drop the cube again with a big oops, and this kid from earlier picks it up and uses the cube to subdue Thanos, tying him up in the grass. In the end, Thanos is arrested by the NYPD for his crimes, and it's pretty embarrassing. In fact, the entire story kind of makes Thanos look like an idiot, but it's pretty funny and definitely worth checking out. Number 8. Loki vs Hulk This epic moment from Joss Whedon's Astonishing X-Men was honored in a glorious way in the first Avengers movie. After leading his alien army into New York and promptly losing to the Avengers, Loki is scheming for a way to change the tide and possibly get ahead when the Hulk shows up. Loki goes on a bit of a tirade about his power and majesty, but the Hulk is not amused. What happens next is a hilarious moment I'm sure you all remember, 
with Hulk grabbing the puny god and whacking him against the floor and walls with the gusto of a middle-aged man with a Terry's chocolate orange. Loki finds himself quickly buried in rubble and serves as a great reminder that if you're not prepared to take on the Hulk, you probably shouldn't even bring your evil empire to Earth. Number 7. Sabretooth and Wolverine These two guys have a lengthy history of kicking the crap out of each other, and their origins are even wrapped together, so it kind of seems like they're destined to go toe-to-toe -to -toe for centuries. Sabretooth is a bit obsessive about Wolverine, seeking him out every year on his birthday and making his life a living hell. Given that they both have a crazy powerful healing factor, you would think that they'd just fight forever like Joker and Batman, but that's before Wolverine finds a sword that can nullify healing factor. He uses it to take out Sabretooth in seconds, slicing clean through his neck and sending his head flying off like a dodgeball. It's a super badass moment and totally awesome to finally see Sabretooth get what's been coming to him. It's a comic book death though, so before you know it, Sabretooth is getting brought back to life, being brought back from hell by a cult of magic ninjas. That's just the way it goes. Number 6. Ord vs Colossus So Colossus technically died in 2001, but it was a comic book death and you know how those go. In 2004, Joss Whedon's run on Astonishing X-Men gave Colossus an epic return as he goes up against the supervillain Ord in issue number 5. Ord is an alien super warrior and a pretty serious dude. He once took on the X-Men by himself before Colossus had joined the team. These two have a bit of a history as Ord experimented on Colossus' body against his will to help create the mutant cure. Experimenting on somebody usually leaves them foaming at the mouth, raging for revenge, and Colossus was definitely ready for some vengeance. Ord asks him, do you think you can stand against me because you're made of steel? To which Colossus responds, not steel, rage, I'm made of rage! And he just totally lays the beat down, even delivering a signature double hammer fist, Hulk style. Number five. Harley Quinn Tragedy Working with the Joker has got to be taxing mentally, probably even physically demanding, but it's mostly the going insane that you would have to watch out for. Harley Quinn is a great example of this, and her dynamic relationship with Joker has unfolded into all kinds of different directions over the years. During the death of the family story, Joker does a whole bunch of super messed up stuff, including walking around wearing his own face that was cut off earlier, and tricking the entire Bat family into thinking he's cut off everyone's faces. If that wasn't bad enough, at one point, Harley winds up at Joker's mercy after he fails to kill her by dumping her in a vat full of chemicals. She wakes up, chained to the wall, surrounded by corpses, and Joker drops a bombshell. She is not the first Harley Quinn, and she won't be the last. It's like the ultimate confirmation of her fears that Joker doesn't love her, and he's just using her as a disposable sidekick. It's an epic moment that really highlights the depths of Joker's insanity, and totally a tragic moment for Harley. If you haven't read Death of the Family, I definitely recommend it, although it's a bit on the gruesome side, the artwork is incredible and there's some really crazy moments. Number 4. Lobo Gets Decapitated Harley Quinn is an incredibly popular character and as such has some super epic moments and is a great provider of fan service. She knows how to deliver. In the Injustice comic, she actually ends up killing Lobo after getting juiced up by a pill that gives you super strength. Where can I get a prescription for those anyway? Asking for a friend. So Harley sort of teams up with Green Arrow and Black Canary and the three of them wind up being followed back to Arrow Cave by Lobo. Lobo gets shot in both of his eyes by Green Arrow, and then Canary follows this up with her signature Canary Cry. At this point, Harley leaps on top of the main man and tears his head clean off. Lobo is a super powerful dude, so to see him get done dirty like this is a surprise to be sure but a welcome one. This event is highlighted by the fact that Harley and Lobo actually once had a short romance, but it definitely was not meant to last. Number 3. Composite Superman This next one comes from way back in the 1960s, in an issue of World's Finest Comics, number 142, in which Batman and Superman go up against Composite Superman. Also known as Joe Meech, Composite Supes is a total failure in life, and he just wants to be somebody and be remembered. He somehow ends up working as the caretaker in the Superman Museum, and one day, a bolt of lightning strikes some of the super-powered artifacts and gives him the powers of all the members of the Legion of Superheroes. He makes himself a costume that's a mix of Batman and Superman styles, literally just like split down the middle like Two-Face, and he even ends up learning their secret identities. It's a crazy storyline made even crazier by the ending. Composite Superman 
is totally wiping the floor with Batman and Superman. They don't have a chance, but his memories start to fade away and disappear, and he risks just forgetting everything that he's ever done. In a last ditch effort, he tries to write some stuff down before he passes out, but just doesn't make it. It's all the more embarrassing as poor Jason Meech just wanted to become somebody and now not even he will remember that he once had awesome superpowers. Number two, Lex Luthor cries. This one comes from the final issue of Grant Morrison's All-Star Superman published in 2006. In the final issue, it seems like Lex might be victorious in the end. He's taken a special concoction that gives him the powers of Superman for 24 hours, and he uses this time to try to take over the entire planet. However, things get really crazy when Clark Kent reveals himself to be Superman and fires a gravity gun at Luther. Things start getting emotional, and Lex is in this cloud and has kind of an epiphany about the pettiness of his hatred for Superman. Not only does he cry like he just saw the end of Infinity War, but his special concoction wears off too and he loses his powers. Lex starts complaining about how he had a vision and he could have saved the world, but Superman just lays the smack down on him and says, you could have saved the world years ago if it mattered to you, Luther. It's totally awesome. Number one. Doctor Doom vs. Squirrel Girl. This one is likely one of the most infamous supervillain defeats in Marvel history. The notoriously nefarious Doctor Doom has some seriously epic evil plans, and despite Iron Man's best efforts, he winds up on top, and Iron Man is in a pretty tough spot. Luckily for him, our native nutcracker from the Great Lakes Avengers, Squirrel Girl, shows up and drives Doom to the brink of madness with the help of her furry friends. Thousands of squirrels overwhelm Doctor Doom's ship, chewing on the wires and distracting Doom himself, while Squirrel Girl helps Iron Man to escape and confront Doom. Squirrel Girl has actually taken on some crazy characters in her past, like Wolverine and Deadpool, and even Thanos. However, this defeat of Doctor Doom at her hands and the hands of a thousand tiny little squirrel hands definitely takes the cake as one of the most embarrassing supervillain defeats ever. Number 10, Clowned Around. Okay, we're going back old school for this one right off the bat. Kathy Kane entered Detective Comics in issue 233. She was a circus trapeze artist who turned into Batman, the usual, you know? She was a pretty big deal in comics. She was around from 1956 to 1979. So she was around for 252 issues. She was a part of the Bat family. So what happened? How did she go out? Was it heroic? No, not at all. How did a well-trained Batwoman get taken out? Well, let's answer that question. Now, at this point, she was retired. She was still running a circus, but nonetheless, she was retired. She wasn't choking out bad guys anymore. The League of Assassins find her, and then it turns into this brawl, even with Batman showing up at one point. Now, Batman is useless. He gets knocked out, and then when he wakes up, everything's done. The action's done. Kathy Kane is on the ground, holding onto her bat suit, and that's the end of her. That's the last time we see her. That is issue 485. That's the end of Kathy Kane. Okay, there's no big fight, really. There's no closing statement. She didn't save Batman's life. She didn't save anyone at the circus to, you know, it's just, we don't see it. Just a big L, just a big old L. Readers were upset because all this time, and that's how you write Kathy Kane out, just to make Batman darker and to make his arc more cool and Gotham-like. Sure, okay. Number nine, Forgotten Foe. In Avengers issue 57, Vision joins the team. Now the issue is pretty deep because the team is trying to figure Vision out, where he came from, what his demeanor is, all that jazz. All he knows is that Ultron created him to attack the Avengers, which is pretty threatening from a guy who can walk through walls. So we start asking Hank Pym what he knows, but Amnesia makes that a difficult task. Now he finally remembers what happened. He remembers that Ultron started to become a problem. So Hank turned himself into Goliath to defend himself, but in doing so, he went super big and he hit his head off the ceiling of the room he was in. Because, of course, of course that happened. Hank's head versus stucco. He grew big and then he knocked himself out and that's why he couldn't remember anything. Honestly, it makes a lot of sense. Pretty embarrassing, but it checks out. And before we continue on with this list, if you wanna go ahead and give us a thumbs up, that would be super awesome. It's super helpful for our channel. You guys are the best, thank you so much. Now let's get right back to this list. Number eight, Paint It Yellow. All-star Batman and Robin, the boy wonder. The duo goes toe to toe with Green Lantern. And the trick here, if you wanna beat the crap out of a Green Lantern, is to paint everything yellow. If the Simpsons family got naked and fought Green Lantern, there's a good chance they might win. Green Lantern is surprised by this 12-year-old boy's decision. He honestly undermines him. But readers were just surprised that 
he stuck around in the yellow room anyways. I mean, he just kept punching and he was kind of losing. Batman was beating him up a lot. And Batman was distracting him, so at the same time, Boy Wonder steals the power ring from Green Lantern. If you're not gonna use it, you might as well lose it. See ya. He then gets beat up even more. Like, dude, did they paint the town yellow or just this room? Walk into the room, be like, hey guys, I'll see you in the lobby. Good luck. Number seven, Robin's hurdle. So sure, Robin's pretty sweet being able to sneak the ring off and all, but what if I told you that athletic equipment stopped Robin dead in his tracks once before? Teen Titans volume one, issue four, way back in the 60s. The team was curious when a young sprinter won a race to qualify for the Olympics, but he just kept running after, like he was cursed, which is pretty scary if you think about it. Imagine not being able to stop running like Forrest Gump style. Ooh. Scary. Now at the same time, Green Arrow's sidekick Speedy needed their help as well because he was being attacked when he was practicing for some Olympic stuff as well. Some guy tried to sabotage his arrows. His organization called Diablo was behind it all. So there's a clear type of villain out here with a clear project. So the Teen Titans traveled to Tokyo just to make sure the Olympics went smoothly and Diablo met them there. He took the team down so easily and Robin gets caught because he can't break out of five loose hurdles. And that's it, that's the nail in the coffin. The entire team at that point is captured and put in the rings of the Olympics. And then of course, our guest Titan is blindfolded and is about to shoot a bunch of arrows. What a mess. Now eventually Speedy figures it out and the team is saved, but like Speedy had to save all of them. Number six, mugged with a crossbow. Green Lantern, Green Arrow, issue 85. This is so insane. Now the issue is front and center and it's talking about narcotics. So already it's like a very aggressive issue. The first few pages, we see Oliver Queen walking at night and he's in a bad mood. There's some girl problems and some punks try and rob him. Now, it's not like he was tired. He didn't just come back from saving the day. He was actually in a pretty bad mood. Like I said, he had lady troubles. He was ready to fight. He was actually looking for a fight. He was glad they came along. Otherwise, he said he'd have to go home and punch the walls instead. Kyle style, you know? He was ready to go and he was fighting these punks off that were trying to rob him. And then one of them pulled out a crossbow because apparently it's Van Helsing and then, you know, muggers have crossbows all of a sudden. And then Ollie gets shot through the shoulder. He didn't even like regard the guy. He's like, oh, arrows. <laughs> I don't know my way around that. <laughs> like, it's still an arrow. You're still made of skin. Of course. Number five, Tony and Dr. Doom. So before we talk about this one, we're gonna fill you in a little bit on Doreen Green. She made her comic book debut in Marvel Super Heroes Volume 2, Issue 8, back in the early 90s. Now she was born with these squirrel-like abilities. Her name is Squirrel Girl. She has a tail, right? You get it. She learned that she could communicate with squirrels at a young age. She was 10. So in an early comic book, she took on Doctor Doom at one point. In Marvel Super Heroes Issue 8, she bumps into Tony Stark and she's showing off, right? She wants him to see what she can do. It's pretty impressive for a pitch. Squirrels start coming in out of nowhere. It's like a musical. It's nice. And then she commands them all to jump onto Tony and even he's impressed. He's like, wow, this is crazy. And then in comes Dr. Doom to make things even more crazy. Doom interrupts Stark's electronics and just like that, Tony is out of the fight, which was going to be my main point here. But in order to save Tony, Squirrel Girl had to send a horde of squirrels onto Doom's ship to get him out. That's how Tony Stark needs to be saved, a bunch of squirrels. Now these squirrels weren't part of the Avengers. They were just able to be controlled by Doreen. So no idea how these squirrels with little hands took down Doctor Doom. They didn't get a chance to fight. Doctor Doom saw all this and he was like, I'm out of here. The Avengers, I can fight. A bunch of squirrels? No, that's where I draw the line. And then Doreen later joined the Avengers in their 2017 run. What a time. Number four, Wolverine gets even more ripped. In our last video, we broke down some ultimate Wolverine facts and his super cool adamantium skeleton that isn't as strong as it is in our regular Marvel 616 universe. Now, it still sounds like a pretty good time. You have adamantium laced into your bones, like the Terminator almost, but one time Magneto used that weakened adamantium against him. It's just as horrible as you're probably imagining. This all takes place during the Fatal Attractions event, and honestly, I got goosebumps reading this. The adamantium mixed with his bones wasn't that strong, so Magneto pulled the adamantium out and it was like water coming out of his body. It was loose, it was liquidy, and it probably didn't feel good. Professor X thankfully wiped his mind after he healed, which is great, but what about us? I need my mind erased after I just saw that. Are you kidding? I'm just gonna live my head rent free. Number three, The Flash vs. Turtle Man. The Flash is the fastest man alive, but in his debut comic, it was a bit of a rocky start for the Scarlet Speedster. In Showcase issue four, his powers are presented to him. He sees food in the air, it's a great time, it's super speedster. Now when Barry comes across the slowest man on earth, the Turtle Man, appropriately named, it's actually quite challenging. It takes him a few tries 
to get to him. Barry runs into a wall at first because there's a painting on it and he thought that was Turtle Man. So he runs into it Roadrunner style. He runs right through the wall. Bonk. Okay. Weird. And then the chase continues because Turtle Man gets in a rowboat and takes off in the water. But Barry doesn't have a boat, right? But no boat, no problem. Barry now realizes he can run on water. So now the fight should be over in at least three seconds. Barry still can't get a hold of this guy in a rowboat. He keeps running by him and he's just missing the boat. It's so infuriating. Now eventually Barry whips a few donuts around him, but I mean, it's not like the robo was doing zigzags. He was going three miles an hour, just straight. Number two, the punch. This one comes from Justice League issue five. Now in this comic, Batman came in to take over the Justice League International and Guy Gardner, Green Lantern, doesn't share the same enthusiasm as the rest of the team. He makes it pretty clear for more than one issue that he doesn't like this new leader. Although Batman is clearly a better fit, but whatever. So he got so upset that he challenged Batman to a fight without the use of his power ring. So Batman's like, all right, let's do this. And then Batman knocked him out with one punch. Blue Beetle got jazzed. He was like Joe Rogan at a UFC night. He was like, one punch, one punch. Oh my God, he was losing his mind. This is a great moment and a greater lesson. Don't take the ring off that makes you a superhero or else you're just a regular guy fighting Batman, literally. And finally, number one, Bruiser vs. Wolverine. Runaways issue 12, we see Logan and Molly Hayes, AKA Bruiser, have a rather quick fight. Now, at this time, Wolverine was a member of the New Avengers and he's trying to get to the bottom of what happened to Dagger. So he, Cap, and Iron Man went to find help from the Runaways, seeing as the signs were leading to Cloak being responsible. Now, Molly, right off the bat, okay, she's one of the strongest superheroes ever, but how she handled Wolverine was way too easy, especially now that he's an Avenger, like he's on the top of his game. So the big three walk into the cathedral, Cap calmly asks her to stop screaming and Wolverine and him are not going to hurt her. The screaming continues and Wolverine asks if she's heard of heightened senses, right? It probably didn't feel good. He gives her three seconds to stop drilling a hole into his brain. He counts three, two, and then the next page he was outside face down in the snow. Just like that. One hit, bam, he was eliminated. And then when he comes back in, he's actually embarrassed. I mean, fair. He just whispers how he won't tell anybody about tonight if they don't. It's kind of funny. Then he brushes snow off, but like, you're an Avenger, Wolverine. Come on, this is, you should have seen any of this coming.